Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened into open session that all council members are present. Our first item on the preliminary agenda is consideration and action resulting from executive session. First thing we have is personnel appointments. First item A is board of adjustment. <clears throat> council member Grady and I have discussed this and we would move that Janet Stovall uh, be made the chair of the Board of Adjustment, that Wayne Rock be moved from alternate to regular, and that Matthew McSorley and Jose Rafael Figueroa be appointed as alternates. I will second the motion. Thank you. I have a motion a second. <coughs> Please, uh, all in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes. Item B, Building Standards Commission Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have the appointment of a chair. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Two and I um, make the well, I make the motion to appoint uh, Peter Kraus, reappoint Peter Kraus as chair of the uh, Building Standards Commission. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Second. Okay. I have a motion and a second for the chair of the Building Standards Commission. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes. Item C's Heritage Commission, member and chair. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem uh, Two and I have uh, decided that uh, we will make a motion to appoint uh, Harold Sickler uh, to continue as chair. And for the uh, open position, uh, we will appoint uh, Chris Robertson. Second. Thank you. I have a motion to second uh, board chair and uh, the uh, <clears throat> member appointment for the Heritage Commission. All in favor, raise your hands. <clears throat> motion passes. Item two is personnel appointments. Uh, first item is Animal Shelter Advisory Committee, uh, member and chair. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, Sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me. <clears throat> uh, for, uh, you know, Rick, would, would you mind uh, taking that one for a second? Sorry, I misplaced my notes uh, on, on that. Oh, would you like Thank me to, to, to do it? Uh, yes, sorry Council about that. Yeah, Councilman Rick and Ellie and I have uh, conferred, and uh, we will continue uh, with the uh, current uh, chair, uh, which I believe Karen uh, Dubrow, and uh, we're going to... Uh, uh, defer action on the uh, open seat until our uh, next meeting. <clears throat> okay. And I, I will second that. All right. Uh, I have a motion to second uh, to appoint a chair and <clears throat> to defer a board member until the next meeting on the Animal Shelter Advisory Committee. All in favor? <clears throat> motion passes. <clears throat> <clears throat> The next item is Civil Service Commission member. Mayor and Council, I'd like to recommend Jackie Billings for the current vacancy to the Civil Service Commission. I'll second that. I'll make it's a motion. Not, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, I'll make a motion to appoint Jackie Billings to the Civil Service All right. Commission. I'll second that. <laughs> yeah, I have a motion and, and a second. Uh, to appoint uh, the member for the Civil Service Commission. All in favor, raise your hand. <clears throat> Motion passes. Uh, C would be Community Relations Commission. Members, interim member, and chair. Uh, Council Member Smith and I have discussed, and we would like <clears throat> for the interim appointment to appoint, make a motion to appoint Vidal Quintanilla. For the other two appointments, we'd like to appoint uh, Priscilla Brown and Magesh Kandavadevil. And then for the chair, we'd like to appoint Johnny Singh. Okay. Second. Thank you. I have a motion to second um, <clears throat> for the Communi Community Relations Commission members, interim member, and chair. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes. Next item is Cultural Affairs, uh, Arts Commission. 
Council Member Anthony Rathelli and I discussed it, and we have decided to make a motion to appoint Diane Cook Goble and Elisa Klein uh, to the Cultural Arts Commission. Second. Um, you know that that actually is something we have uh, we have not discussed. I think we uh, failed to uh, to appreciate the distinction between the uh, the interim member and the regular member. Uh, you you go ahead and pick Julie. Okay. Or, or or do you want to do you want to uh, defer discussion of that so I don't put you on the spot? My my my, my apologies, Council Member Homer. <laughs> Make motion to table that. <laughs> okay, we will you need a coin, <laughs> right? I, I I know. Well, Okay. Didn't want to do anything right. unilaterally. So, <laughs> so uh, your motion is for a member and a chair, correct? Without okay. and member and interim member. Member and interim member, and the chair uh, will defer till next time. Well, I, I, th I think what we're deferring is oh. who would be a member and who would be an interim member because we uh, did not discuss that distinction. So my my apologies on that, but we will. So we'll, we'll th those are the two individuals, but I guess we'll get, get to the formal uh, appointment next time. Okay. We'll defer this whole appointment until next time. Okay. And withdraw your motion, if you don't mind, Ms. Uh, Council. I'll Lemonade. withdraw my motion. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Going glowingly. <laughs> <laughs> Library Advisory Board. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council Member <laughs> Williams and I have discussed this. Uh, there are two vacancies. Uh, we would like to appoint Jessica or move to appoint Jessica Bartnick to one of those. Uh, we have uh, not heard back from a couple of interviewees yet uh, on a kind of a short time frame for the, the other spot. So we would like to defer the second spot to the next meeting. So I would move to appoint Jessica Bartnick and defer one uh, spot to the next meeting. Second. Do we have a chair? <clears throat> oh, yes, and, and for the chair, uh, Gail Marks. My apologies, I left that off the motion. We did discuss that. Still sorry. Or, uh, I'm sorry, G G Gail Marks, that, that's Parks, I'm so sorry. My, go my goodness, so, no, I, I, don't, I don't have my notes here. My, my apologies, <laughs> I'm doing this from memory. So for- um, No, yeah, you're right, we'll have, um, let's defer appointment yeah, we'll, 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 we'll defer the chair, my apologies. <laughs> Everybody following? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, just <laughs> sabotaging me. No, we're going to defer. Uh, well, I think we will defer the whole thing until next time. Okay, that, that, yeah, that sounds like a plan. We'll, we'll so, defer that well, one as well. Then I'll, I'll withdraw the motion. Do we want to defer the whole thing, or make the one appointment and defer the other appointment in the chair? <laughs> we'll just do the whole thing next time. If you'll, I'll, I'll withdraw the motion. Withdraw Thank you. Time. Okay. Okay. Parks and Rec. Planning Board, a member and a chair. Mr. Mayor, um, on behalf of um, Council Member Riccadelli and me, um, we have one vacancy and we appoint Justin Acott and Chair Elizabeth Gale Marks. I, I will second that and that, that's, that's the board that we intend for Gale Marks to chair. So thank you, second. <laughs> All right, I have a motion and a second. Uh, <clears throat> to uh, approve the member and chair of the Parks and Rec Planning Board. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, motion passes. Uh, next item, Retirement Security Plan Committee. Mayor and Council, I'd like to recommend Myra Conklin continue as chair. I'll make that motion. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to uh, Appoint the Retirement Security Plan Chair. All in favor? Thank you. Motion passes. Senior Advisory Board members and chair. In consultation with um, Councilman Smith, I make the motion to appoint Carol Rommel and Sherry Jean Scamardo as board members and Carol Greisdorf as chair. Okay. Second. I have a motion and a second uh, to approve the senior advisory board member and chair, members and chair. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes. 
number uh, or letter I, tax increment financing reinvestment zone number two and three boards, members and chair. Mr. Mayor, um, on behalf of Mayor Pro Tem and uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Prince and me, um, there are three vacancies and this year we are, um, after interviewing all of the ones who are on the list, we appoint Catherine Goodwin, Bridget Taylor, and Travis McDaniel, and I believe the uh, chair would be Corey Reinecker. Okay. <coughs> One second. Are you going to second me? Oh, second. Yes. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to uh, approve uh, the TUR zone two and three boards, members and chairs. All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Motion passes. Next item, item three, discussion and direction regarding Central, Collin Central Appraisal District nomination. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the Collin County Appraisal District Board members are up for re-election. We had um, Wayne, lost his last name. Our, the one that we had selected last time is also up, and he is not seeking reappointment. So we will need you to think about a new nominee, which we will bring back at the next meeting. So if you have any recommendations, feel free to let me know. All right. Thank you very much. Council, that Did was you... Wayne Mayo. Mayo. Okay. Item four, Department Report, Neighborhood Services, Lori Schwartz, Director of Neighborhood Services. Can we move forward with the PowerPoint presentation? I went a little bit too far. Sorry about that. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and City Executives. I am Lori Shores, as mentioned. I am the Director of Neighborhood Services, and I have with me tonight the uh, couple of members of our department, as well as our uh, management team, which is Keisha Siriano, Shanette Eden, and Scott Lucier. So they are here to help me with any questions you might have. Um, but we're here tonight to give you an overview of our department and the impact neighborhood services had within the community in FY 2020 as and through 2021, as well as some of the trends that are affecting our department. Um, it is also timely since tomorrow is National Good Neighbor Day, and I am sure all of you are playing your neighborhood bingo um, and getting to know your neighbors uh, in your community. So. But we are one of the youngest departments in the city, um, coming together just six years ago and in 2015. And we have three divisions, best neighborhoods, community services, and property standards. And we begin working cooperatively together to develop our strategic plan and our pillars of action. Those pillars of action are hope, uh, spell hope, which is help, outreach, partner, and enforce. And our staff decided why we are, uh, our work is so important to the community is that we create hope and we propel positive change so that people are proud to call Plano home. We believe that our pillars of action fit well within four of the five goals of City Council's strategic vision. Help and outreach programs specifically support a welcoming and engaged community, while partner and enforce programs support safe, vibrant neighborhoods. And all of our programs work towards City Council goals of residential and commercial uh, economic vitality and excellent, innovative, and accountable government. While we do not have any specific programs that are geared towards City Council's goal of multimodal transportation and mobility solutions, we do work cooperatively with other departments on transportation and mobility programs that affect housing and neighborhoods as well as our low to moderate income residents. We wanted just to provide a short overview of our departmental customer service requests. Our web-based requests have mostly remained steady with minimal changes over the last three years. The most noteworthy increase over the fiscal years is in our open records request. We started in FY1819 with 400 open records requests that has steadily increased uh, over 550 this year. 
Our call volume decreased last fiscal year, primarily due to the pandemic between April and September 2020. The call volume in this fiscal year is recovering with a marked increase in calls for community services division for social service needs within our community. We continue to be proud of our high customer service rating, which uh, is uh, averaging out about 4.7 out of 5 uh, over the last three years, with close to 200 surveys through all divisions. As we move into our service pillars, I'm going to touch base on programs within each area, and then also changes that we've seen over the last 18 months during the pandemic. Programs within the HELP pillars were most affected by the pandemic due to their heavy use of volunteers. Over the last two years, the Love Where You Live program has experienced significant challenges, including canceled service days in FY 2019-2020. While we were able to continue working on the social transformation aspect of the program by meeting with neighborhood members virtually, the number of projects, volunteers, debris, and trash dropped tremendously, as you can see by the graph. This fiscal year, only 18 projects were completed and the number of volunteers diminished with residents continuing to express concern due to the pandemic. We are continuing to build volunteer initiatives, however, including our Good Neighborhood program, but they have yet to be fully implemented due to continuing concerns regarding the pandemic. CARES, or code abatement by residents engaged in service, brings volunteers together from uh, all over the city to help homeowners need, uh, in need to resolve property maintenance violations. The last 18 months has significantly affected this program. We gained a lot of momentum in previous years with growth of volunteers and stable grant funding. The pandemic affected our ability to attract volunteers and our previous grant partner has shifted their uh, funding focus, so that is no longer a, uh, an avenue for us. The program was just reactivated this summer and we are hopeful we will be able to secure new grant funding for materials to support our volunteers. An opportunity provided by the pandemic and winter storm URI modified our need for volunteers and additional staff support in relation to people experiencing homelessness. The city opened the Plano Event Center to provide daytime shelter to homeless individuals from Saturday, February 13th through Friday, February 19th during the bitter cold of the winter storm URI. Additionally, due to COVID, the homeless census that takes place across the United States each year was modified. Our region decided to conduct the count without the use of volunteers during the same time period due to the pandemic. The city of Plano chose to conduct its count on February 18th, which coincided with the winter storm event. As you can see, these programs assist with meeting many of the success factors of council's strategic vision goals. A significant portion of our work is outreach to residents and community partners to build, to build capacity and knowledge. We're actively seeking outreach opportunities through training, information tables, uh, community events, and neighborhood meetings. The increase in community meetings and participating neighborhoods is the result of the ability to connect virtually through Zoom over the last 18 months. Home buyer education classes were transformed from an eight-hour in-person class to a four-hour virtual class during the pandemic, and we continue to uh, uh, expect a hybrid model um, for those programs moving forward. During the pandemic, the Best Neighborhoods team also created signs with QR codes because everyone was using QR codes when you go to restaurants. So we wanted to increase the response rate for the South Central Plano Plan survey. This worked phenomenally as we were able to increase our response rate to over, by over 644%. The team will use this as a best practice with future outreach efforts. Best Break was also created as a way to connect with residents and neighborhood leaders virtually. Topics included burglary prevention, how to work from home while homeschooling your children, home assistance, property maintenance, and more. The virtual environment actually increased the number of neighborhoods the Best Neighborhoods team was act able to reach. In the third year of publication, our e-newsletter, Building Best Neighborhoods, has continued to expand our region to the community. Over this past year, we have increased our subscribers by over 50%. Although we are well above industry averages for open rate and click rate percentages, we did see a drop this fiscal year. So we are working closely with communications and community outreach to try and ensure that the information that's provided is in line with uh, our requests from our citizens. We are also continuing to grow our connections with neighborhood groups, and we've increased our in, uh, neighborhoods even during the pandemic. Um, there has been a focused effort to connect with our multifamily communities, and we now have 11 registered and engaging with our department. 
The Neighbors Connect program has also thrived this past year with specific educational opportunities for resident leaders as well as peer-to-peer -peer interactions. Neighbors Connect was able to continue with the creation of the best break that I had mentioned earlier. Through this virtual connection, we have actually been able to reach more unique neighborhoods and residents than in person. In its second year, the Neighborhood Leadership Academy was able to graduate two neighborhood groups out of the five that registered. The pandemic did cause some challenges for the other three groups, and they may enroll in the program at a later date. This third year is starting in October with a plan to hold both virtual and in-person meetings. And this program was recognized by Neighborhoods USA as a finalist for the 2021 program of the year. And since resident leadership is one of our major neighborhood revitalization strategies, we are always looking for ways to equip our leaders and build the capacity of our neighborhood groups. The HOA Legal Clinic and Neighborhood Summit, co-hosted with the cities of Rowlett and Garland, transitioned to virtual this year. While there was a drop in attendance from previous years, we still saw 27 neighborhoods represented from across Plano. Sorry, got behind. We continued the property maintenance workshop, workshops this last fiscal year with virtual trainings that were held in February and a socially distanced in-person training this month. In the coming year, we plan to add specialty workshops, including one taught by women for women. And property maintenance minutes continue to be an outreach initiative that focuses on common violations and ways to resolve them. Although production of additional videos were paused due to the pandemic, we are planning a tree trimming video to assist residents whose trees were damaged in Winter Storm Uri. We believe our outreach initiatives also help to achieve council strategic vision within these three goal areas. The majority of our initiatives and programs fall under our partner action pillar. One of our most popular programs is the pop-up party trailer with 100% satisfaction rating. The trailer program was paused during the pandemic, which is indicated by the decrease in reservations participants from 2018 to 2019. Neighborhood leaders are now back reserving the trailer, however, at a slower pace due to continued concerns regarding the pandemic. However, the trailer is booked every weekend through September and October this year. The Neighborhood Vitality and Beautification Grants are continuing to be an incentive for neighborhood groups to invest in their community and improve public areas adjacent to their neighborhoods. In 2020, we approved 40 beautification projects for a total value of 573,000. 43% of these were new applicants um, from our growing number of newly registered neighborhoods, and it continues to provide an incentive for homeowner groups to connect with the city. Many grants were introduced in FY 2017-18 and continue to build capacity for neighborhoods that are just starting to organize. These grants assist with projects such as new neighborhood packets and neighborhood event promotions such as National Night Out. The best designation program was paused during the pandemic. However, the program has since resumed and is now open through the end of this month for new applications. We are continuing to seek ways to help our neighborhoods qualify their designation program and to find ways to help them be beautiful, engaged, safe, and thriving through many of our department programs. The Great Update Rebate remains one of our most popular programs. The program remained open throughout the pandemic, but we did have several modifications to make while uh, we were working with homeowners during this time. We've extended timelines due to construction and supply chain delays, um, and it also affected our other rehabilitation programs. This past fiscal year, we saw 120 projects completed with 3.5 million in homeowner project cost. Since the inception in 2014, there has been 26.9 million in home improvements invested into neighborhoods through the Great Update Rebate. And this is just a, a uh, idea a map to show you the extent of that 26.9 million in home investment. Our day labor center continued to provide a safe venue for temporary labor placement for the majority of the pandemic. This facility was closed only temporarily in conjunction with other city buildings last year. The center's labor placement rate has increased 39% since COVID hit last year and is 17% higher than it was in FY 2018. The number of contractors and laborers is higher than last year, but it has not recovered to its pre-COVID uh, pre numbers. So our department has also administered grant programs of $25 million funded by the U.S. Housing and Urban Development and U.S. Department of Treasury federal programs, as well as the Buffington Community Service Grants Program, which is funded at $2 per capita. We normally receive $2.4 million in grants annually. The federal pandemic relief programs have increased this funding 10 times. 
While we have worked closely with community partners to administer these programs, this also had a significant effect to our community services staff workload over the last 18 months to meet increased citizen needs. Over this past fiscal year, 41 applications were underwritten and 20 home repair and rehabilitation products were completed. As mentioned previously, we also had to modify program requirements due to more costly pro projects with construction increases for materials and uh, contractor costs due to the pandemic. The city's rapid rehousing and other homeless programs have continued through the pandemic and expanded due to federal relief funds. The TBRA program is specifically for those that are homeless and have been affected by COVID. This program began in February 2021. We have also seen over 700% increase in encounters or calls from those that are at risk of becoming homeless or those that are homeless. We will be discussing homelessness more in depth this evening following our department presentation. Two new programs were also introduced during the pandemic, the pop-up theater, um, which has everything that a neighborhood needs to host a movie or a game night, and the neighborhood fitness competition. Uh, this competition was created as we noticed residents were out walking more, and uh, we had a great first year with that, so we're hoping to continue this year. And the Nuttiest Neighborhood supports meeting community food needs and will continue again in its third year. And the CARES volunteer program uh, was paused during the pandemic. We repurposed our trailer to a tool lending program. While this had been part of our strategic plan, the pandemic accelerated development of this program. We saw consistent use from 2020 and 2021, and a new video was just released to show how to borrow tools from our trailer on weekends that CARES events are not scheduled. Our partner initiatives strongly support many of the key success factors for your strategic plan goals. Our final action pillar in force is primarily overseen by our award-winning property standards division. As described earlier, digital complaints, including Fix-It Plano and website submission, continue to grow as the preferred method for reporting violations. We are seeing an expected shift from utilizing the website to the Fix-It Plano app. Website complaints dropped by 12% and Fix-It Plano increased by 10. Over the last five years, we've seen an approximately 20% drop in the number of complaints that we receive as we continue to build our outreach and assistance efforts. This slide shows the change in the way that we received complaints over the last five years. The two largest sources of complaints in 2016, anonymous or over the web, have decreased while the usage of the Fix-It app uh, has in significantly increased. While the anonymous complaints have gone down, we believe that these may be uh, being absorbed into the Fix-It Plano complaints because the anonymity afforded through the app. There has also been a reduction in the percentage of invalid complaints received. All complaints are verified by a property standards team member, and over the last five years, there's been a 20% drop in complaints without a violation found. We believe that the departmental focus on outreach as well as available informational resources have contributed to that reduction in complaints. So this map shows a distribution of complaints by type over the last year. As you can see, it is widespread across the community. And this map shows proactive inspections by the city uh, property standards staff for the last year, also widely distributed across the community. Over the last year, the number of inspections by property standard staff have remained stable, both proactively and in response to citizen complaints. 95% of those violations were addressed voluntarily by property owners. The remaining 5% were addressed either by assistant programs, contract abatements, or through the court process. And then this just uh, is a slide to give you an overview of typical case durations to understand timelines from complaint to case closure. Those violations that are more complex, usually relating to housing or building concerns, have an expected longer case duration. We have also developed new ways to assist homeowners with coming into compliance with city codes through the pandemic. Our outreach and assistance letter acknowledges the difficult time we have all been experiencing and provides opportunities for assistance. We also added more virtual resources, including video inspections, virtual meetings, and other virtual communications. And I've already mentioned the CARES tool lending program to help residents resolve violations when they do not have the appropriate tools. Finally, this past fiscal year has also brought disaster recovery responsibilities for the property standards team. Winter storm URI significantly affected our department due to multiple water line breaks, particularly in multifamily developments. We worked cooperatively with multiple departments to provide bottled water drop-off to the affected residents and provide fire hydrant spigots. 
The response to Winter Storm Uri continues with identifying trees that were damaged or killed by the bitter cold. We've worked closely with the Parks and Recreation Department on identification of these trees and will begin sending letters to homeowners to address high priority trees this week. The enforcement of city council adopted codes and ordinances helps meet the success factors to achieve your strategic vision as well. So finally, we want to touch base on top trends that we are seeing in our departmental work. The first is the continued need for residential and commercial property maintenance as our city continues to age. The longer a property maintenance violation is allowed to remain, the more significant the damage and cost to repair. We believe we need to continue to look for ways to partner with property owners to maintain their homes in commercial areas, and in particular, senior residents with fixed incomes. The next trend is overall housing affordability and maintaining strong neighborhoods. While the building stock is aging, so is all the other neighborhood infrastructure, including trees, streets and alleys, and community open space. While the community investment program has been actively addressing public infrastructure, the pace of growth in 1970s to 1980s is also the pace of decline now. We believe there needs to be a continued focus for reinvestment into neighborhoods and finding ways to build neighborhood social strength as we see a period of change to our population. And finally, our last trend is the continued demand for technology solutions. There's an expectation of flexibility for virtual and in-person meetings and events due to the pandemic. This also affects our ability to utilize volunteers as many continue to be concerned with in-person activities. There is also an expectation that people want to be able to access information in their own time, which is often after hours. We continue to look for ways to meet this need in building up all of our outreach efforts. I know that has been a lot to cover um, between the memo and this presentation, um, but there is so much more that we could share. But if any council members would like to learn more about our programs, we would like to invite you to participate in any of our virtual or live events or ride out with staff if you'd like to learn a little bit more about how our programs affect the community. So thank you for your time this evening, and we are all available for questions should you have any. Thank you, Lori. Lori, could you go over the, um, the progression for, towards enforcement, where we start and we usually where we end up with enforcement as far as just a philosophy from staff? Sure. Um, so I would say that as far as just general code enforcement, um, you know, we had talked when I presented to council um, back in April that one of the important parts of this is compliance and not uh, enforcement. Um, our hope is, is that we're going to be able to educate our residents of the concerns that, that we have, um, why it is a violation of city codes, why it's important to, to maintain the property or to address the violation. Um, and then we work through outreach and assistance letters. Um, first, if they have never uh, heard from us before, we have all sorts of uh, sort of gentler methods of, of talking to uh, our residents either in person. Um, we have courtesy notices, we have door tags, um, and then we have the outreach and assistance letter that I mentioned. Um, should they not respond, um, then we will move forward with a notice of violation letter. Um, and if they still don't respond, um, then it usually goes into an abatement or a court action depending on the type of, um, of uh, violation that it would be. But you know, our hope always is, is to be cooperative partners with our residents. We want very much to uh, sustain neighborhood health and uh, the strength of our community for the building stock. Um, so that is always our hope, is, is to have that cooperative conversation um, and hopefully be able to address that um, in a positive manner. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilman Grady. Lori, um, thank you for this presentation. Um, as you and probably most of your staff know, I follow your department pretty closely, probably to your chagrin, yeah. <laughs> um, because it touches on so many of the, of the issues within the community for which I have a passion. Um, but I did want it to um, not only ask a couple of questions, but point out some things that I think were really extremely important. I think our Love Where You Live program has been absolutely wonderful. And in and, and talking to the people that receive that work from that program, um, I am hopeful that uh, as we go into the future that our volunteers that we saw in the thousands um, will come back um, and, and participate in the program again. Um, so anything that we can do to help um, propagate that so that they uh, come forward, I'm, I'm more than happy to do. Um, I was extremely pleased with the response um, from your department 
the fire department and others um, during this very hard freeze and the amount of people that we actually sheltered in the event center um, that we, sh we helped shelter um, in overnight uh, warming stations, um, primarily POWs here in the city, um, because it helped a lot of people survive uh, what was going on, and then having to deal with the aftermath in their homes, um, which was devastating to many. And so uh, I know that uh, you all contributed a lot to that, and, and so I just wanted to express that thanks. Um, the 13 community meetings, I've participated in some of those and certainly in just looking at some of the meetings that you've had with home repairs. Um, I think those are wonderful and have been very helpful to the people that have participated in that and just listening uh, to their conversations. I overheard a, con uh, a conversation not too long ago, and, and maybe you can confirm it, but there is a very large city to our south that came up and took a look at our day labor center and determined that that was the best practice and has now determined to develop at least two, if not four of those in their city. Um, they made a mention to that, I believe at their city council meeting that I was watching, but they never mentioned that the day labor center, may, the one they were referring to um, was probably the one in Plano. Um, so I don't know if you want to even disclose that, um, but I think that it's an, a wonderful acumen when a very large city sees something that we've done and want to replicate that in their city for the help of their citizens as well. So I applaud you on that, that wonderful achievement that's going on over there. Um, finally, I wanted to point out a couple of things. The $25 million grants that we've done um, for, for the pandemic relief have absolutely helped a significant amount of people, including small businesses. Um, and I want to thank you for all of the um, work that you and your staff have put in on that. Um, I've watched that very closely from a, from a state, a county, and a city, and a local level to figure out where the dollars are coming from and where the dollars are dispersed to. And it was really important to see um, that they were being dispersed very rapidly and Plano again was taking the lead on that along with the city of McKinney and Allen. Um, but primarily we were helping out communities throughout the entire county that didn't have the staff and Plano was there to help those cities with their residents as well. Um, and the work that you're doing certainly with rapid rehousing is extremely important. The big thing that I wanted to point out is the top trends that you were, um, you were uh, basically alluding to. And, and I hope that we can really emphasize many of the things that you have in here and we can push these things forward because we, not only do we have an aging stock, we have an aging population and many of them would like to move and downsize and move into a facility that doesn't cost them the same amount of money if not more than the facility they just left. Um, and so somehow we have to figure out how to solve the issue of housing within this community so that we can provide affordable housing to individuals that want to downsize, thus freeing up the building that they have to someone that wants to move into the community. Um, and so anything that we can do for senior housing, aging housing, um, and the overall affordability, um, I am more than willing to spend any amount of time and, and make any kind of connections that we need to in that area. But again, thank you for all of the work that you and your team do. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to visit you in your new location. You used to be right around the corner from me, which is why I was there. Um, but now that you have hidden yourself into a new location, I don't have the key to the door anymore. Um, so I haven't been able to come over. But Thank you, and please convey that to the rest of your team. Thank you. We have an amazing team. I appreciate all of the kind words. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. So the aging population of Plano loves Plano. And, um, and I actually saw that firsthand when I was invited by the Neighborhood Service to go and watch Love, um, Love Your Neighborhood, um, I guess, projects that were going on, and many of the volunteers that um, came out. Uh, I made the mistake of um, writing with Deputy City Manager Greg Russian because he stopped at every house and talked to every single one of the owners in which there was um, people who are volunteering. And um, 
I, I, I was um, trying to elbow him, but he didn't really care. Um, but I think it really um, show that it's not just the volunteering. It's not just the um, the helping to, to rehabilitate or to renovate a house, but the social interaction really, really is the key to loving your neighbors. And, and I think that really, sh um, you know, just watching the interaction between Greg Russian and many of the volunteers um, with the owners, I think it really, um, it brought home the reason for this, and the reason for this program. It's not just fixing houses. It really is about, um, um, you know, bringing the community together for the neighborhood. So I want to commend you for that. I thought that was great. And anybody who has not been on one of those tours should definitely go. Thank you. Councilman Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. And Lori, thank you for that great presentation and for the great work that you and the Department of Neighborhood Services are doing. Um, among uh, some of the other great things in your presentation, I was struck by the slide that highlighted a 20% reduction in no violation found. Mm -hmm. And it looks like that happened precipitously from 2017 to 2018. There was basically a 20% a drop in one year. I was wondering if you had an idea of what the Department of Neighborhood Services started doing differently that led to the precipitous drop in complaints with no violation found. I would say probably the biggest thing is our outreach and education efforts. Um, you know, we came together as a department in 2015. It took us a little bit of time to kind of understand how we fit together as a group. Um, and we started actively beginning programs um, in 2017, 2018. And, you know, prior to that point, education may not have been a, a um, major focus. Um, you know, while they stood, still did education, they, ha they didn't have the benefit of having all of the rest of the divisions with them. Um, to support um, that education portion. Um, but, you know, in 2017, 2018, um, we started our, our property maintenance workshops. We started our Building Best Neighborhoods newsletter. We started doing, you know, videos. We, we were doing a lot to try and share information. And I think once it, we also have updated our website, um, so there's just a lot more information out there. Um, that's been a very important focus because we honestly believe most people want to do the right thing. They just might not know what the right thing is, or they don't have the physical or financial capability to do it. Um, so I honestly believe that you know it's it's a combination of those efforts. Um, that our property standards team is amazing. We were co department of the year in 2019, so um, I can't say enough for them. I think they do a great job. Well, thank you for that information, Lori, and thank you for the great work that you and your team are doing. Clearly, those education efforts in 2017 and 2018 paid off with, you know, an almost 20% overnight drop. So that's, that's something we can maybe, you know, emulate efforts like that in other areas as well, because clearly that just paid immediate dividends. So thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm you're, going to turn You're up. Over. You're I'm up again. Actually, I'm actually going to turn it over to Shanette Eden, oh, who is our okay. Housing Community Services Manager, and let her <laughs> take over this presentation. But I'll stay up here in case there's any questions. All right. Our next item is the homelessness update, which is item five. Welcome. All right. Good evening. Mayor, Council, City, um, City Executives, I'm Shanette Eaton, Housing and Community Services Manager, um, of course, a part of the Neighborhood Services Department, where y'all just heard our wonderful director speak. So tonight, um, I am here to talk to you about homelessness. I'm going to give you a quick kind of brief update on where we're at with our homeless numbers here in Plano on a one snapshot time. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you um, and ask you for some guidance on actions just to explore. Tonight, as you see slides coming forward, I'm just asking them what you would like staff to explore. All right. So looking here on the slide, you can see that the unsheltered population from, 19, from 2019 to 2020 actually decreased by 10.6%. So um, we like to say in here, that was the year actually that we started receiving funds from the state to have our rapid rehousing program. We do believe that that helped to move people that were homeless from being unsheltered to sheltered. Then you can see the rise from 2020 to 2021 of 38%. Um, and that's what we've seen this year. You know, COVID happened in 2020 and it affected all of our residents, homeless and those that are not homeless. When you look at the sheltered population here 
From 2019 to 2020, we had an 11% increase, as you can see. And what I'd like to say is that also will coincide with that decrease. I think we were able to house people with our rapid rehousing program, and those funds that we received for the, from the state have been extremely helpful. We see a decrease in the shelter population, though, when you're looking at what happened from 2020 to 2021. Um, I want to remind you all, it's mentioned in the memo, that when you're looking at our unsheltered population and just our homeless in general, of our homeless population in 2019, 54% of them were employed. 33% of those that were employed were employed full-time. Um, 2020, 50 percent of them were employed, 9% um, of them had full-time jobs. So the next three slides that I'm going to show you are actually actions that we as staff just would like further direction on if you would like us to explore. And of course, present back to you at a later date. So the first one is what we call, it's going to be our community-wide education strategy. This is the first action um, that we would like you all to um, give us guidance on exploring further. Um, it is an actual um, um, dashboard that will be used as an outward-facing dashboard on our website for our residents and business owners to look at. What you're seeing now is an internal dashboard. You can see there's a heat map in the corner of it where it shows the location. This internal dashboard is something that would be used internally by our police, fire, parks, and rec library um, library departments to further assist our homeless. I've got pros and cons on every slide. You can see one of the pros um, is that it uses something we already have. We already have our geographic information system. This is GIS based. Our GIS team put this together and it can be used and turned on as quickly as you all say or further explore. Um, it also will um, will just go ahead and hopefully answer some of the questions that we get. A lot of times staff gets questions regarding the numbers of homeless in Plano um, at our point in time count or um, any kind of data like that. It would go ahead and provide it outward facing to our residents and our business owners so that they could see it. And it would be updated um, annually for sure. The next action for you all to consider allowing us to further explore is a community-wide campaign. Um, the community-wide campaign um, would actually allow us to further assist residents who truly don't know what to do when they encounter a homeless. Um, they're unsure as far as um, how they could assist or should they call 911, which I'll get to a little better, a little later. But under the leadership and guidance of our communications and community outreach department, we would further explore what a community-wide homeless education for both our business owners and our residents would look like. The last action that I'm going to talk about on the community-wide education strategy um, for you all to decide if you would like us to further explore is what looks like a Fix-It Plano app but for homeless. So what we have found here at our city is that sometimes residents will call 911 instead for non-emergency events, instead of um, maybe they don't know where to call, they don't, maybe they don't know our number, um, the neighborhood services department, or maybe they don't know the non-emergency police line. This is an app that is GIS focused and generated that, an, um, that a resident could actually go in and say, hey, I've seen a homeless person here. Um, they don't have to put their name there. They can do it anonymously. They can say what they've seen, and it would allow our departments, police, fire, parks and recreation, neighborhood services department, it would allow us to go ahead and address the situation without um, having them call 911. All right, so the city of Plano received or has been allocate, allocated about $1.9 million in Home American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, these funds must be used to help homeless to, um, by providing them shelter or um, helping to pre prevent them from becoming homeless. I've listed the activities up here that you can see. So, if we were to use these funds, which you all can always say no, that you don't want to receive these funds, but if you were to receive these funds, um, um, these are the ways on here that you 
would have to allocate the money per HUD regulations. HUD, if you notice in the memo, I said that HUD hadn't released it regulations. Well, they're going to have their first webinar tomorrow, so staff will better know exactly how these funds could be used, more than just the allowable activities that you see on the screen. Um, the remaining slides, as I go forward, I want you to remember, are for you all to tell us if you would like us to explore them. And that's for the use of these funds. The first one is a hotel conversion to affordable housing units. Um, this goal is focused on, or this action here, the goal of it would be to focus on moving homeless from on the streets, unsheltered, into self-sufficiency, being housed. What it would look like, we don't know. We'll have to explore it if you allow us to. But per the memo, we're looking at ex exploring possibly two different locations. Um, I don't know because we have not started exploring. So if you ask where are these locations, we don't know as staff yet. But we believe it might be a possibility here. One location would be for our families. What I didn't mention on the slide before is when I spoke to PISD, um, they spoke to us about the 460 homeless youth that they had in PISD. And that was just that one time in 2021. So when I'm talking about a, something for families, that would be more towards the, um, the families in PISD that, we're, that are here and living here and going to our schools. The other one would be for, for the general population. When I say general population, I am talking about singles, um, single individuals, those that don't have families with them, adults. All right, the other um, action that we could further explore is something that we already have. It would be adding money to our tenant-based rental assistance program. The tenant-based rental assistance program is, um, it is a program that we already have right now that we're using HUD funding for. And it allows us to provide up to a year of rent and utility assistance to homeless individuals here. So they literally um, will be homeless. We will assist them in finding a place to stay. And then once they find that place to stay, they'll get case management and services. And I failed to mention this two slides ago. But the first action and the second one, these are not actions that will be done by city staff. City staff cannot do this. Um, we're not the experts in doing things such as this. What we would do is contract it out to nonprofits, which is what we're already doing with our existing rapid rehousing program, as well as our existing tenant-based rental assistance program. The pros and cons are already on the screen. They've been here. Um, I won't go through them. Um, because you see them, but um, it, it, it's just more of adding it to a program we have. The difference between this and what you saw before is that with this program, um, the availability of apartments or places for people to rent is the concern. The, and I keep going. So the third action here that we could use home ARP funds for is a hotel conversion to a non congregate emergency shelter. When I say non-congregate, that means separate units. You're not in a big room like your typical emergency shelter, but you really are separate and you have your own unit. Um, you can see on here pros and cons. I will say this is different from the other hotel conversion. This conversion, we would still explore the option of having two locations, one for families um, with you know families, children, and another one for um, singles. Um, or, or just adults in general, what we call the general population. But the difference here is this is a shelter, whereas the last hotel conversion is not a shelter. It's creation of affordable housing for people to live in longer. An emergency shelter, as you saw in the memo, typically people live in from 30 to 60 days, 90 on the top end, but it doesn't create a place for them to go afterwards or for them to actually have a longer term case management and services. And the last action here is going to be if you all decided that you, you didn't want to take the home ARP funds, um, what staff would explore doing is what we call a community circle. It literally is using what we, using the individuals that we list on the homeless management information system, HMIS, I've said that really fast, but it's an HIS, HMIS system that we enter in homeless individuals into that we encounter. The reason we do it is so that we can provide case management and connect them to services that may not be available here in Plano for them. So we would use that list and address homelessness one by one, one individual by one individual. And we would, we call it a community circle because it would include a lot of nonprofits that provide services to address that homeless um, 
the homeless person's need. So more than just shelter. I'm available for questions. Councilman Grady. You knew I was, <laughs> I was coming on this. Um, okay. Several things because I wanted to address many of the points that you brought up in many of the, uh, the items. So I'm going to give you my thoughts. Um, but what I wanted to point out to everyone um, that may be listening, that is, uh, are attending today, that are around this dais, is that um, homelessness in and of itself um, is not um, is not the uh, basic center of where somebody gets to. That there's a, a significant amount of incidences that happen in and around an individual's life that get them to the point of being homeless. So um, I don't, uh, I, I want to, as you were talking about educating the community and using a dashboard and, and, and an educational campaign, is that when people look at homelessness, they think that's the problem and the cure is to either move them out um, or put them in a box. And that does not solve the issue because the issue really is, is how did the individual get to that point? What happened in their life? And what do we need to do in and around that individual to be able to prevent it or make it very short lived so that they don't have a recurrence of homelessness? So it could be things such as a significant health event. It could be violence within the family. It could be um, death within the family. It could be a, um, an incident where uh, the weather changes and everything in your house is destroyed. Um, there could be a fire where everything in your house is destroyed. Um, so there's a lot of things from an educational standpoint, a healthcare standpoint, and everything else. And the reason that I wanted to bring that up is because many of the um, ARPA funds that you were talking about in the use of the ARPA funds, um, putting a person into a converted hotel for affordable housing is a, is a great idea as long as there are caseworkers on the first floor that work with the individual to determine how did you get to the position of where you are and then build a roadmap for the individual to then finally get out of that situation so that maybe it is because they decided somewhere in their life that um, at 15 or 16, I no longer wanted to stay in high school. I no longer wanted to stay in my family unit. I left. I do not have a high school degree. I've been working in the service industry. The service industry closed down. I am now unemployed. I couldn't pay my rent. I'm out on my own. I am homeless without an education. I need a GED. I need a high school degree. I need further education to get an associate's degree or a college diploma. All these things take place. And that's just the educational side, much less the healthcare side of dental and, and medical and, and anybody that has substance abuse uh, issues. All those things have to, be, have to be wrapped around an individual in order for them to move on with life and become a productive individual in society and to themselves. So I think that the use of the ARPA funds is extremely important when we talk about it from the standpoint that you are absolutely correct. The city can't build a hotel, the city can't take over a hotel without state approval um, to turn it into either an emergency shelter or affordable housing. But that's exactly what Collin County and this community in Plano need. Um, because if we don't have some place that we can place them and then provide the services that wrap around them, we will always have the problem of homelessness because we haven't cured the issues that create homelessness. So when we can, when we can solve the issues, and, and a, a concerned citizen sent most of the council members documents that indicate this, that as soon as we can solve those issues, we will solve the issue of homelessness. Um, homelessness is not putting them in a rapid rehousing and, and saying, there you go. I can't afford housing if I don't have a job. I need a job. I can't get to the job because I was arrested for being homelessness. I was uh, given a Class C misdemeanor, and I have to check on the box that I have now been arrested. 
the the box says have you ever been arrested for anything other than a, mi a minor motor vehicle issue and i have to check it yes and the issue then becomes you're not employable because i checked the box yes and so that is a concern as well so i am all for an educational campaign so that people really truly understand that anybody in this room anybody in this city can become homeless in a fraction of a second i know that because i was there twice and i don't want anybody to ever doubt how ugly it is so i I um, apologize for being emotional over it, but it's a big issue. And when you walk and talk with people that are on the street, they don't want to be there either. That's not where they want to be in life. And for us as human beings, we need to be able to take their hand and pull them out of the, of the whirlpool they're in and move them into some place where we can take care of them. That's what we've been commanded to do by nearly every religious writing that there is. So an annual report on a homeless dashboard, I like the homeless dashboard idea. I wish it was updated more often. If you have an HMIS system, I hope that it would be able to feed back to the dashboard and be able to provide it information so that we know it on a more rapid basis. The educational campaign, extremely important because people just don't understand what the real issues are. And in having an app where people can report it, you're correct. Dialing 911 does not solve the issue. It creates a further problem because now you have an arrest. And so that, that doesn't help the issue. It also doesn't help the issue that we think that every single person that might be homeless is sitting there because they have a criminal record or they ha there is something violently wrong with them. I can't tell you the number of women that I've met that the violence was brought against them and they have left with children and they have no home. And thank God there's a few facilities in this city that will take care of them when, when they are in that situation. But we don't have enough of them because the violence continues and that violence has got to stop. And so it's not the homeless woman's issue it's the perpetrator of the violence. That's the issue. So having a hotel that's converted into an emergency shelter where we can take care of people and then put them into a transitional living facility such as affordable, affordable housing is a great idea. And I can tell you there's a slew of nonprofits and many for-profit corporations that are willing to get involved in this. All we have to do is say, this is what we're going to do. The rent assistance has helped. I've seen the rental assistance help many times, and I would continue to support it. And finally, I just want to say that HMIS is really truly the answer of being able to track somebody and finding out what services they need, what services do they already have, and how they move forward. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Council Councilman Grady, for your passion on this issue and I know that this has been a passion and something that you've worked on for many years so I want to thank you for that. Um, I'd like to start with a s slide one and just give you some real quick feedback um, so that you have at least thoughts from me. Um, well not slide one, the first one that you asked for feedback on. I have some concerns about um, putting all of this out on a dashboard I, just from the sense of I, I don't know that everybody needs a heat map or to know exactly where we have homeless people. I don't want anybody targeted. I don't, there's just a, a lot of concerns I have with that. So I don't necessarily know if there's more pros to this than cons personally. Um, reporting app, I, I, I think that that could work as, con as um, Councilman Grady said. Um, I also wondered if potentially we could see if we could embed it into the Fix It app. I don't know about others, but I have 8,000 apps and every day somebody wants me to get another app and I don't want another app for another thing to do. So I know a lot of people already use the Fix It app. If there's a way to make it simpler so that we don't have to educate people on a new app, I think that would be much better. And then um, I'd just love to know, you probably don't know this yet, but how much money would be available to us if we did accept those funds? 
Um, I'd like to know that. And then um, I'm not opposed to getting more information about any of the other suggestions at this point. I'd like, before I could make a decision, I obviously need more information. And I know you said you could look into it. But to the point of, um, but the, to the point of the communities at not having enough rental assistance in the community, I do know that from conversations I've had with some in that community, um, some of them said that they potentially would be open to taking more. It's just on their end, it's a lot of administrative work and they don't have the people to handle it. So I don't know if there's conversations we can have or things. I, I just think it's a challenge on both ends. So um, I'd love for us to explore that a little bit more. The amount. Yes, um, I just wanted to um, give a few comments. The heat map that you saw in here definitely wouldn't be displayed to the public. Um, that's an internal facing one that I showed you a clip of. So that wouldn't be the case. Um, definitely that wouldn't be the case, just as you're thinking about it. And you know the, the amount from the home ARP oh, funds? Oh, I'm sorry. The home ARP funds, it's 1.9 million approximately. Over what period of time? We have until 2030 to use the funds. 1.9 million um, until. But the way HUD looks at their funding, if we're going to accept it, we would like to use it sooner than later. So um, I, I think this is really heavy. I mean, I, I think um, everybody has their own idea of um, what would be a, a good way of solving um, this the homeless issue, and I personally have my own because I think um, some of the homeless issue has nothing to do with violence or um, being out on the street because of loss of jobs. I think a lot of it also nowadays is mental illness and a lot of um, issue that comes with that. So um, I, I, I think I need more time to absorb, and I, I, I'm not sure if you know giving you a hastily direction of you know where we should go with this issue is 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 really a um, you know responsible way of of handling you know this. However, I, I do I, I do agree that um, we do need to have uh, some type of solution for homeless, and I also believe that there needs to be a central area where um, there's. It's kind of like central information area, I guess, where you know you can direct somebody there, whether it's the homeless person or whether or not it's the um, the people who need more information. There should be a central area where that um, should be uh, disseminated. So that's that's all I can really offer. Uh, thank you very much for all this, Jeanette. Um, I'm in agreement with Councilman Grady that uh, I'm in support of the individualized community circle approach uh, <clears throat> because. There are a variety of factors that can contribute to somebody becoming homeless. And uh, also to Deputy Mayor Pro Tem's point, uh, many homeless individuals uh, do suffer from addiction and mental health. And this is a good way to identify their individualized needs and direct them to the appropriate uh, nonprofit and faith-based uh, community groups. Likewise, I'm fully in support of community education, um, not just to help people understand how they personally can avoid homelessness, but to better understand uh, how they can support these efforts by the faith community and nonprofits to, uh, to care for those who are homeless and help um, them get on their feet, um, recover from homelessness, and uh, get on with their lives the way they would prefer. Um, <clears throat> to, the, to the extent that when somebody is homeless, they need somewhere to go. I'm, uh, I'm generally in support of potentially a hotel conversion uh, to an emergency shelter, as long as it is truly an emergency shelter, uh, not just a place to go if um, you're in between apartments, um, but truly for those in need um, and most in need, um, whatever the guardrails around that are. Um, I, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem is also right. This is a heavier discussion. But uh, I'd also agree with um, Mayor Pro Tem, Prince, that uh, an additional app um, may be a lot, but if this could be incorporated into the Fix It Plano app, which maybe that would necessitate a rebranding of the Fix It Plano app, but still, I think uh, <clears throat> an incorporation into the app we have might be more appropriate. 
Councilman Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for that report, Jeanette. Um, as several have articulated and as Councilmember Grady so eloquently said, uh, I, I agree that we need to do something. Uh, we need to help people who find themselves in a situation of homelessness that's good for them. It's the right thing to do. And it's also beneficial to the community to, to solve that issue. So it's, it's a win-win. Uh, we need to do something that works. And um, I also feel that I need to understand this issue better before making a decision. I would love to see empirical data on how some of these strategies have worked, other communities that have tried them, you know, what's been effective, what hasn't been effective, because I think that would help us determine a strategy that, that's going to work, especially uh, similarly situated communities to Plano, um, you know, what, what's working. Um, as far as uh, questions, um, I saw on actions, uh, action one certainly, and, and, and I think action three would work similarly, that there would be an RFP for a third party vendor to do the conversion, and there would also be an RFP uh, on action one the um, the emergency shelter uh, for uh, management of the emergency shelter, but the facility itself. Am I understanding correctly that that would be a city owned facility, or or with the third party through the RFP acquire ownership of the facility? So this has been done many different ways, and so that's something that we would have to explore. And I would bring back. There are some cities that have created these com and converted it and actually handed off the power to okay. the city. Just set it up and mm -hmm. let everybody go forth and do good. But that's something that we'd have to further, we'd have to further explore and get back with you on what everybody is doing. Well, thank you for that information, Jeanette. My, my personal preference, and again, I think as several have articulated, it would be premature to give direction, but my personal preference would be uh, to find a reputable nonprofit that would operate this and hand off ownership of the facility because what we're looking at with these home ARP funds is a one-time source of funds. And we always have the discussion, you know, for example, when we're talking about what to do with a sales tax surplus, don't use a one-time source of funds to create an ongoing O&M expense. And so I would be wary of uh, creating ongoing O&M, uh, given that the federal funds are a one-time source of funds. Um, so um, I, I think that would probably be good. And, and given that we could spend the funds until 2030, I, you know, we could probably even, you know, fund a few years of, of operational expenses as a nonprofit got up to speed on doing this. But I, I think that would probably be the best approach, um, you know, assuming that we can find a very reputable, very effective nonprofit that's going to take on this responsibility in the community and then contribute the funds to them. And I also agree with what we've said about uh, fix it and, uh, you know, or some reporting mechanism that, you know, that would help with, uh, um, w with identifying individuals in need of help and also uh, uh, increasing our education efforts. So thank you. So I think what I'm hearing, Rick, real briefly, so we can um, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Mary. J just a couple of things. I, I, I would say I don't think any of us have the knowledge and experience with uh, this issue as Councilman Grady. And I really appreciate the uh, the comments that you made, but you know, I have also had interactions uh, with more than a few homeless individuals and had lunch and and actually talked to them as 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 an individual, you know, one, one on one. And I think following up with something that uh, Deputy uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, too said, very nice people, but obviously there there is some mental health issues you know going on so i think anything that w we look at we need to consider that you know it, as well the other thing uh, that, I, that i will say that i've noticed in making some calls and trying to follow up to try to get assistance for some folks that are trying to not become homeless is i think we really need to do whatever we can to minimize the 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 now let's see how to say this nicely, to make it as smooth as possible to try to get this assistance for people. Because I think the last thing we, we want to do in trying to help is to aggravate the situation. So I know we, you know, you have to have checks and balances, but 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 the 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 less headaches that we can have in there to get somebody the help that they need, special for for the uh, the rental assistance, keep somebody from being thrown out, you know, thrown out of their park. Now that the you know the the restrictions have been lifted, that 
that may be you know a re real reality but but thinking about uh, you know the the rapid uh, you know rehousing or something like that I think these are all good ideas but but the mental health issue and the and the reduction in the in the headache factor I think would be two two things at the top of my list thanks so I I think the main thing I think we need to hear from you, I think with the exception of Councilman Grady, most of us don't know how to solve the situation. I think for you uh, and your team, we would like as much information possible to make the right decision. And to pursue those opportunities would be the best thing for us to find out which is the best way to go with recommendations from experts that actually do this on a regular basis. So uh, I think this council certainly wants as much information as possible so we can make the best decision for our community. And with that being said, I, I, I think we'd like to know uh, the pursuant of these options to find out you know, which one's best for this city. So uh, I, hopefully that's okay with everybody. Uh, and when you have that opportunity to bring it back, I think it'll be better for us to make the best decision. Lori? I think the main thing we were hoping for this evening is just if there were any that you wish to exclude. Um, we just were, were trying to touch base with you at this point. So um, Jeanette and I will work on uh, with the teams because we've got some amazing people that are experts um, on homelessness in our department um, to bring something back. But it sounds like you would like for us to explore all of the options at this point. Nothing has been taken off the table. Okay. Yes. Uh, quick. I, I'm also in agreement with, uh, I think it was Mayor Pro Tem who said it about the dashboard. If it were public facing, I would have concerns about that as well, but I think it would be very useful internally. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are five minutes away from starting our general meeting, and so we are going to uh, suspend the item six, seven, and eight. Uh, until we get through uh, the beginning of the uh, general regular meeting. So we will begin the regular meeting right at 7. <coughs> so we have about five minutes before that begins. Thank you.
I now declare that the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. We will begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Father Marco Rangel with the St. Mark's the Evangelist Catholic Church and the Pledge of Allegiance and the Texas Pledge led by Troop 1000 with the Resurrection Lutheran Church. Please rise. Blessed is our God at all times now and always and forever and ever. Holy and mighty God, first we thank you for all the many blessings bestowed on each one of us in our community of Plano. Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, inspiration, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of community. Fill us with your grace, Lord God, as we make decisions that affect us and those around us. Continue to bless and protect those in law enforcement and their line of duty so that they might protect those of us who have placed our trust in them. God, please bless these men and women in city government and the mayor's office, this council, all elected officials. During this time of the ongoing pandemic, I pray that you especially guard and protect those who put themselves in harm's way like law enforcement, firefighters, and emergency medical service workers. May we, as a community of Plano, continue to grow and build a better and more peaceful society by all we do. We ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now for the Texas Pledge. On the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Father Rangel, for leading the invocation, and Troop 1000 for leading the pledge. Gifts are hard to come by, guys. Gifts are hard to come by. <laughs> Could you get a special Mayor Pencil? <laughs> you don't want to pass that up. You don't want to pass it up. All right. Thank and you, if, Mr. And if I gave you a, a bad color, thank you, James. Come back and get the other. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. This will give you a A plus in all your studies. <laughs> Sir, let me get the small one right here. There we go. Okay. Here we go. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Can you hear me? So we have a certificate of uh, commendation for the estates of Forest Creek. They received a national award for the Neighborhoods USA first place newsletter of the year. Wow. So I'll call forward Keisha Siriano, who's the Neighborhood Engagement Manager, and Sahar Esfandiari. 
uh, the senior planner, Estates of Forest Creek President, Kathy Kankel, and other neighborhood residents. Come on up. Congratulations. Let me just read this. Come on, come on over here. The City of Plano would like to congratulate and recognize the Estates of Forest Creek for receiving first place in the Newsletter of the Year for 2021 National Neighborhoods USA Virtual Conference hosted by the City of Fort Worth, Texas. We proudly applaud all involved in this achievement and eagerly anticipate sharing additional, additional successes with you going forward. Congratulations. And we have another certificate of commendation. Wiffle Tree 5, 6, and 7 received a national award for the Neighborhoods USA, fourth place for Neighborhood of the Year, and finalist for Newsletter of the Year. I'll call forward President Jim Skelly and other neighborhood residents. Welcome. Hi, Good to see you. Nice, to see you as well. nice contraption. I'm yeah, <laughs> I think your wife had something similar to that. Oh, yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> afraid so. Bad memory. Um, so I'll read the Certificate of Commendation. The City of Plano would like to congratulate and recognize Wiffle Tree 5, 6, and 7 for their fourth place award for Neighborhood of the Year and for being a finalist in the Newsletter of the Year category at the 2021 National Neighborhoods USA Virtual Conference in Fort Worth, Texas. We're excited to co commend everyone involved in these outstanding achievements. Look forward to hearing and sharing about your future success. Congratulations. And we have a presentation. The Plano Engineering Department has received Silver Integrated Stormwater Management certification on their updated stormwater design manual for the North, uh, North Central Texas Council of Governments. I'd like to call Allison Smith, Senior Engineer, Caleb Thornhill, Director of Engineering, Clay Lipscomb, CIP Engineering Manager, Michael Martin, Development Engineering Manager, Russell Erskine, Senior Engineer, Don Griffin, Senior Engineer, Stephen Jones, Engineer, Josh McNeil, Engineer, and Carolyn Horner, Senior Environmental Development Planner for the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Come on over. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Allison? I was going to say oh. a few things, no, uh, not, no, not, not, not to yeah, be a no, mic hog here, awesome. but uh, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Allison so you don't have to listen to me too much, but, uh, and I will say I enjoyed the, uh, the mayor's time here, Mayor Loisilier, uh, but it is much easier to say Mayor Munn, so um, I appreciate that. I'm Caleb Thornhill, Director of Engineering, and uh, like I said, I'm going to turn it over to Allison. We're uh, missing a few staff uh, tonight, but uh, I want to let Allison Smith and uh, Russell Erskine here, I've done the, the heavy lifting for this and uh, really appreciate their efforts. And with that, Allison, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, this evening, the North Central Texas Council of Government is going to present the Integrated Stormwater Management, also known as ISWIM silver certification to our department for revisions to our drainage manual. Um, we started revisions a couple of years ago on a 30-year-old manual, so we updated our design criteria and standards. And um, with those revisions, we incorporated a lot of ice swim criteria, which includes um, 
stream bank protection, water quality protection, and flood mitigation. Um, so now the city of Plano will be one of eight cities in the DFW area that is iSwim Silver uh, certified. So with that, I'll hand it over to Carolyn Horner. Um, Thank you, Allison. I actually have just a couple of one. Not the, who you want to? I have a couple of words, but oh, okay. organized. Here, you, let me do that. I'll, I'll take the mic again. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Carolyn Horner, and I'm a senior planner at the North Central Texas Council of Governments. I'm honored to be here before you tonight to present you with the Integrated Stormwater Management, or ISWIM, certification. The COG Public Works Council is pleased to announce the City of Plano's achievement and designation as a certified silver ISWIM community. The ISWIM program is regionally recognized, cooperative initiative that helps cities and counties achieve their goals in three areas, water quality protection, stream bank protection, and flood mitigation. By becoming an ISWIM certified community, the city of Plano has demonstrated that you uphold these standards in your engineering regulations and development ordinances. As of today, you are one of nine total certified ISWIM communities. There's one gold and eight silver, <laughs> the others being the cities of Salina, Corinth, Denton, Fort Worth, Frisco, Grand Prairie, Irving, Kennendale, and there are 14 founding communities that were the original start to this program. COG would also like to recognize one of your staff members, Allison Smith, who has played a pivotal role in coordinating this achievement. To commemorate this achievement, COG is presenting the city of Plano with a plaque and street signs to display where you choose. Congratulations on achieving these outstanding environmental stewardship and responsible design and development management techniques. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. I think it's this. Okay, we're moving back to uh, the preliminary open meeting, item number six, review of back, backyard chicken ordinance changes. Mr. Cantrell. Okay, well, good evening, uh, Council. I'm Jamie Cantrell, the Animal Services Director. Um, uh, here to talk with you a little bit of, again about our uh, backyard chicken uh, ordinance changes. Um, wait a minute. We do we is this the preliminary? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. So um, uh, we've discussed this uh, several times um, in the past, and some of the newer members actually probably think I'm a one-trick pony because all I ever come and talk about is chickens. <laughs> I I do know about a few other items um, that deal with animals in the city, but um, uh, do we go back? Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure he's in the right place. Um, so the last time that I was here, council directed us to um, uh, uh, make some changes um, or, or bring a draft that would allow for um, backyard chickens. Um, uh, so this is what we're here to discuss now as well. This is this, this is not my stuff, so I'm trying to get through here to where it is. So. Um, so I'll just go off the top of my head because we don't have what's there. Uh, 
so we uh, uh, went through the process. Uh, once I got direction from council, um, we met with uh, the Plano Hens group, um, which is a Facebook group of, of Plano residents. Um, uh, and I talked to council or talked to our legal department. We created a draft, presented it to them. We went through it line by line, basically. They gave me direction and said, well, we don't like this. We do like this. Maybe we can change that. Um, and, and we came to a compromise that, that I felt was a, a pretty good place for us um, to move forward with. Uh, we then had that vetted from um, the planning department, um, uh, the health department, building inspections, because all of those will be impacted in some way a little bit by it as well. So uh, once we had all of their feedback, we made a few more changes. Um, went back also to get into Plano Hens also to, to, to make sure they were aware of everything that had been done. And then we went to our animal shelter advisory committee um, meeting and, and they discussed it at length. Um, it was our typical animal shelter advisory committee meeting is about 45 minutes. Um, that one was closer to three hours. So we, they really went down in depth with this and talked about all the pros and cons. At the end, they voted unanimously to approve all of the, um, uh, or recommend that, that you approve all of the, uh, the changes um, to the ordinance that, that w with regards to uh, backyard uh, hens. Um, and so uh, uh, some of the things that we have put in there is that this is a permitted process. Um, there are minimum requirements for the size of the coop, uh, for the conditions that the birds must be kept in, um, for um, an educational component as well for people who want to uh, keep the, the, uh, the, the backyard hens. Um, and then we also try to be very aware of the people that were in the neighborhood who might not want chickens. So we have a lot of things that are designed to prevent nuisances. Um, the food containers, uh, food must be stored in closed, uh, locked in or closed containers. Um, so that way it hopefully won't um, attract in any sort of, of rodents, uh, vermin. Um, it, we're obviously not allowing roosters because that's normally where you get the, the biggest uh, sound complaints are, are from the, uh, the, the roosters. Um, and we also are, are not going to allow um, any slaughtering of the animals in the public view. That's already in the ordinance, um, but that would also apply to chickens. Uh, also, we, we have, um, it's a little difficult again going off the top of my head with everything. Um, uh, did they put it in afterwards, maybe? Maybe. Let's. You're great so far. Well, uh, it's. <laughs> it's not in there. So, um, but all of those things were designed to um, uh, prevent nu nuisances as much as possible. And we also utilized existing ordinance to uh, be able to address the, the issues. Um, so, our pet limit, we're not changing. We have currently, you have the right to have uh, 10 animals on a single family type of lot. If you so choose and you want to have 10 chickens, you can do that. Now, if you have five dogs, you can't have more than five chickens. So it's up to each individual resident to decide how many chickens that they want to have with regard to the, the rest of the animals that they may want to keep. Um, we use the same permitting type of process whenever it comes to uh, revocation and appeals, um, if that were to be necessary, as we do in all of our other permits. Uh, which that doesn't happen often. Uh, we've been using this, um, uh, we've had these permits in place for over 10 years and it's happened exactly once where we've had someone, uh, a permit that was revoked. Um, we also use the accessory building um, requirements and our animal housing enclosure requirements that were already in ordinance to deal with coops. So that helps with setbacks from the neighbors. It also helps with location and placement within the yard um, because all coops have to abide by all of the accessory building um, ordinance requirements, even if it's not big enough to actually have to be permitted through the building inspections as an accessory building. Um, so we tried to do everything that we could to um, uh, make this as simple a process as possible, um, but also as, as very respectful of both sides, the people who want to keep chickens and those who do not want to keep chickens. So uh, with that, are there any questions that we may have? Thank you. Appreciate it. We have two speakers uh, that uh, requested to speak at the preliminary open meeting uh, item, which is this one here. The first one is Amanda Massengill.
and Georgia Thurman will follow. Hello, I'm speaking in favor of changing the ordinance for backyard chickens. Um, he went through all the technical things. I went in a different direction a little bit. Raising backyard chickens is an excellent idea for some, and Plano citizens should be allowed to make that choice with their family. Raising hens is no more foul than other animals that are allowed by Plano Animal Services currently. The fine folks at Animal Services are not bird brains. They have put together a comprehensive flock of regulations and resources for those who are interested in backyard hens. Any, oppo any opposition that I have encountered relates to pets across the board and is not unique to backyard hens. With the ordinance that's proposed, Plano hens will be living in impeccable conditions and new hen owners won't be able to just wing it. Thank you to the wonderful staff and those who are serving on the Animal Services Board for your time and attention to detail in putting this ordinance together. And I hope you, are as I hope you, as our esteemed City Council, will approve it with a resounding cluck yes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. so cute. I don't think I can follow that very well. Uh, I actually expected there to be a lot of opposition and I was like all geared up for that and I can't see that I need to be right now. Um, I'm thankful the City Council is examining this issue and in light of the pandemic and shortages and the fact our city stands for sustainability. I really appreciate you all examining this issue and voting um, for uh, going forward for having backyard chickens. And um, I did want to say that um, I believe that all intelligent, educated people who raise pets and chickens can be pets and will be pets, um, will overcome any negative issues. And there are negative issues for all people and pets and chickens. And um, so I, I thank you for you examining this issue. And, and I, I hope and pray that we will vote uh, permission for these chickens. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, I was sitting here trying to rack my brains for some good puns. You covered all bases, so my compliments. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, next item is item seven, consent and regular agendas. We do have speaker cards for um, item I. Is that right? D. D. D, D and U. So uh, those two items have been pulled uh, because somebody wanted to speak on them. Is there any other item that uh, a council member would like to pull? Okay, thank you. And last item on the uh, preliminary, preliminary uh, open meeting would be the discussion and action for future agendas. Mr. Mayor, I have one item that I would like to add to a future agenda. The Senior Advisory Board uh, produced on May of 2021 a very intensive report on the 2020 Plano 55 plus survey dealing with senior citizens. It contains a significant amount of important information that I think council members should hear. And I would like to um, invite the uh, chair uh, and members of the um, Senior Advisory Board to make a presentation about that survey at a future meeting. Sounds good, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, I would like to add, uh, uh, the staff may already be working on this, but uh, a report uh, at a future meeting on options for continuing with remote uh, comments for residents on agenda items. Uh, I understand that the Governor Abbott's uh, emergency order is expiring, which presents legal challenges. There are still legal ways to do it, but then there are operational challenges with that. So I would love to understand better the... Um, the options that are out there, the, the feasibility, the cost of those options, and uh, discuss that at a, a future meeting. Okay. Thank you. We'll do it. 
Um, moving back to our regular meeting, we're going to uh, go to comments of public interest. Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern that are not on the, and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items, but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. And I do have two speakers this evening. The first one is Steve Levine. While Mr. Levine's coming to the podium, uh, I think Deputy Mayor uh, Pro Tem had an announcement. Go ahead. So, Steve, I'm sorry, I'm going to um, interrupt you for for a minute so you can organize your presentation. Um, this month is the um, the annual peanut butter drive for um, the North Texas Food Bank, and we only have a few days left. And um, for those of you who don't understand that even in affluent counties like ours, there are children who are going to school hungry every day. And just like the issue that um, Council Member Grady was talking about with regard to homelessness, um, it, the, being hungry is directly connected to that. And we can't have our children going hungry to school, going hungry anywhere. And, and I, uh, I beg you, in the last three days that we have left in September, please see if you can go to the grocery store and just cling out the peanut butters <laughs> and then bring them to the North Texas Food Bank so that we could have a very successful campaign um, for the end of this September month. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Levine, your time is up. You'll have to <laughs> <laughs> good Stage evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, and City Staff. Uh, my name is Steve Levine, 6212 Jacqueline Drive in Plano. Uh, today I'm speaking on behalf of the Avignon Windhaven Homeowners Association, of which I am a board member. And I wish to express the need for a traffic signal at the intersection of Windhaven and Willow Bend to allow safe access to Windhaven Meadows Park from the north side of Windhaven. Um, this stretch of Windhaven from Parkwood to Spring Creek has no traffic signals or stop signs and passes a community park with traffic often moving up to 20 miles per hour or more over the posted 40 mile an hour speed limit. Traffic studies have been done and over the past five years have shown these higher average speeds. Now, uh, right now, um, the uh, signal that we're requesting would be at this intersection. This is Avignon over here. This is the location of a senior living community to be built. Um, it will contain uh, some 500 or more senior living units uh, directly across from the park. Um, this traffic poses a direct threat and obstacle to safe passage across Windhaven by pedestrians and bicycles. It's not a safe situation for our children, adults, or the senior citizens. Um, our HOA has previously appealed to the traffic engineer for a signal at this intersection, uh, however, to no avail. Uh, and we have been advised to appeal directly to the council. Um, so I would like to ask the council, direct the city manager and associated departments to consider a protected crossing in both directions, uh, excuse me, uh, to allow safe passage uh, to this park uh, from the other side of the road. And also note that there is no um, uh, sidewalk on our side of Windhaven uh, going east, so it's really hard to even get across the road if you wanted to move closer to the park entrance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next speaker is Beth Carruth. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Hi, um, I am um, wanted to talk to you guys tonight um, 
about the um, the continu- continuance of Zoom um, for your meetings. And I know that on September 1st, um, the suspension of the Open Meeting Act uh, was um, removed by Governor Abbott. But I also know that um, there's options in there that you guys can decide upon. Uh, Last week, I signed up to speak at a Planning and Zoning uh, Commission meeting, and I signed up via Zoom, which I had never done before. And at the last minute, it was canceled due possibly to technical issues. And that was when I realized how important it was to continue Zoom capabilities. I I had heard a statement in in Planning and Zoning by Nathan that Zoom would no longer be uh, allowed because of the Open Meetings Act. So after some research and total laziness, I decided I needed an expert. So I called uh, the Texas uh, Attorney General's office because I have a a phone line for this and asked a lot of questions. And here were um, the the, uh, lawyer's main points. Um, The first one was the city may continue Zoom. It isn't prohibited from being done by by us. Um, Secondly, uh, there is no increased risk legally by having Zoom. And the last thing she pointed out to me uh, was any citizen can sue the government at any time for any denial of rights, it, 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 you know, whenever. So as far as thinking that Zoom or not having Zoom is going to change any of that, that's, that's not the case. Who um, will be helped by the continuance of Zoom uh, in, in city meetings? Well, first, the elderly. Uh, Second, citizens providing care of a child or an elder, people with transportation issues, people with complicated schedules and would like to participate in our city. Um, And the most obvious of all, of course, is a citizen with health issues, uh, like a recent surgery or uh, contagion, which like the COVID thing, Um, mobility issues, broken bones, Many people are disabled internally, but you know you look at them and you can't even tell that they've got a problem until they walk or you hear them breathe. So there's a lot of people um, that would benefit from the continuance of Zoom as, a, as an option for um, our meetings. Now, I don't think there's going to be some big rush uh, and you guys are going to have tons seconds. of speakers via Zoom, but I do think um, it's, a great, it's a great option. And I think it would it would increase um, communication and um, participation in the city. And similar apps are used in medicine and business and, and legal activities and social. So it's not some unusual thing. We've been doing it for over, I think, over a year. Maybe Paige can weigh in on that. So I would think City of Excellence that we would have the very best technology available to all of our citizens to help them in their daily lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Curry. Any more? Yeah. Um, is it possible to request an AG opinion about uh, the necessity for um, remote speakers to use video? Um, I provided the city manager with the, there's limited ways to ask for an opinion, and he has that, but the statute does say that the participation is by video conference, and it does refer to teleconference and other parts of the statute. So I really think that a legislative change is needed to clarify that. But also I think in the discussion that comes back at a future agenda, I think um, more option and information can be provided about technology that can accommodate that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the consent agenda. I will say one more thing. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Mayor, (laughs) but um, people can email now. You know, the video is not the only option. People can email in comments, and the city secretary will provide that to all of the council if they're not able to attend. Consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from the agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. 
Motion to approve the consent agenda except for items D and U. Second. Thank you. I've, I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of items D and U. So it says public comments. <laughs> we could vote on that. <laughs> so I, again, I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of D and U. Please vote. <clears throat> motion passes eight to zero. Item D, uh, we have a speaker. We do. Let me get this clear. Okay. We do have a speaker for item D, and it's Richard Dingman, and he is via Zoom, so let me bring him in. Mr. Dingman, go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Go ahead with your comments, sir. Oh, thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is Rich Dingman with RDA Equipment, a certified small business located in central Minnesota, um, registered Texas comptroller, taxpayer, and vendor, and also registered registered with the uh, city of Plano as a vendor. Uh, RDA Equipment is a factory direct authorized OMER USA Lift equipment distributor. So we specialize in heavy duty, uh, vehicle equipment solutions for municipalities, truck dealerships, Department of Defense, etc. And Omer Lift has been offering lifts in the U.S. for over 40 years now, and ultimately providing world-class service and support, uh, support competitive pricing, uh, and providing the highest quality lifts really available that are ALI certified. Um, installations are performed by RDI and the uh, Omer Lift Factory support team that includes equipment set up, on site safety training, product operation, uh, and operational training. The reason why I wanted to reach out uh, was after reading the agenda and items, uh, recommended action for the vertical rise drive on lift and the uh, workhorse lift was that the city council was set to, uh, to prove the purchase under the existing. Source well contract. Omer USA uh, private labels these lifts for Mohawk, the actual vendor listed in the item summary of the agenda through Source Well. And RDI is a factory direct Omer distributing distributor. So ultimately, at the end of the day, allowing savings to be passed, you know, directly to clients. And, and after some review based on one vertical rise lift and one of the four post lifts, the city of Plano can certainly expect to realize a savings of twenty-five dollars to $35,000 for identical and equivalent listed equipment um, with a distributor as myself. Uh, we also like to think that we offer a more responsive service for equipment, technical, and repair needs. So I guess at the end of the, the day, and in, in summary, RDI equipment with uh, Omer Lift to request the opportunity to provide an estimate based on the item summary. And as stewards, uh, as taxpayers, this would ensure the best value ultimately for the municipality. Thank you so much for your consideration and time tonight. Thank you. Mayor Council, I'd like to ask Dan Prendergast, our uh, brandly new minted uh, Director of Public Works to, to come down and provide uh, a quick comment. Dan has done some homework on this item today, which is um, a carryover from um, Mr. Cosgrove. First day on the job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mayor Council, my name is Dan Prendergast. I'm the Director of Public Works. Um, in this item, we had a 99,000 pound vertical rise lift 
the current lift uh, is not functioning appropriately. It won't lift the 84,000 pound fire trucks in a level manner, so it's not safe. So this was an emergency item. Um, we thought about actually doing an emergency purchase and then doing a, a, a ratification in council, but wanted to go through the buy board uh, to possibly save some money and also be um, upfront and uh, transparent. So uh, that was that lift, and on the 50,000 pound four post lift, that typically raises up like bucket trucks and things like that. That lift was installed uh, with the expansion of the Fleet Services Center, and that was in 2004. Uh, it, we inspect our lifts every two years for safety, and this lift did not pass inspection this year. Uh, sometimes it gets stuck in the up position, and sometimes when it comes down, it comes down a little uneven as well. So we need to get that replaced very quickly. And also thought about doing the emergency purchase with that as well, but instead did the buy board and came through council. Um, so that's why we ended up doing that. On the buy board uh, options, there were only two options for, these, for um, the vertical rise lift especially. That was the current manufacturer that isn't working out for us and the Mohawk one. So we chose the Mohawk and that's why we went with that one. Any further questions? Thank you very much, Dan. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. it's great to be here. Mr. Mayor, I, um, hearing the comments, I, I see no reason why we should delay this item. I'll make a motion that we pass item D. Second. Thank you. I have a motion, a second. Any questions, comments? All right. Uh, a motion, a second for to approve uh, item D. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Item U. Item U, to repeal and replace in, in its entirety Article 4, Peddlers, Solicitors, Itinerant Vendors, Carnivals, and Job Placement Activities of Chapter 11, Licenses and Business Regulations of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Plano, and providing a repealer clause, a severability clause, a savings clause, a penalty clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. And I have three individuals that would like to speak on this item. The first one is Jeremy Matthews. Good evening, Council. Uh, I'm Jeremy Matthews, uh, and I live in Plano. Uh, I just wanted to talk about this um, ordinance because, uh, well, first I wanted to thank the uh, City Attorney's Office for working on updating this ordinance. I think it needed uh, some updating in regards to you know, re you know, regulation of free speech. And uh, so I kind of comment this from a uh, political canvasser's point of view, and I've canvassed for a few of you up here on the dais. And uh, I'm just, I, I think it's a good ordinance. It's, it's going forward. And, uh, but I'm a little concerned about the, uh, the no trespassing part of it. In, rega in regards to political canvassers, in that um, you know, there's a up to $500 penalty, uh, you know, for trespassing uh, if you have a sign that says no trespassing. But um, as a political canvasser, well, I, and I respect if, if somebody has a sign that says no trespassing, and as a if I'm canvassing for somebody, I'll move on and I'll go on. Uh, and especially if that's a private individual, you know, that has their sign for that. But, you know, the city has, you know, our own, you know, our own signs that includes no trespassing. And I just sort of think that it's a little bit at cross purposes when we have this, reg this ordinance that, you know, it's kind of clearing up, uh, you know, who can uh, solicit and things like that. But then if we have this uh, penalty for no trespassing uh, and then we're restricting it, it's almost like we're we're stifling, you know, kind of political speech and getting out to the voters. I know that these signs are for, the whole idea is for crime prevention. And that's a good idea, it's a great idea. And, uh, but I'm just wondering if it goes a little bit too far and that maybe there's some exemption for political canvassers. Um, because I think it's in the interest of the city to, uh, you know, to inform, you know, the public when the, about who the candidates are. I, I canvass for, numerous hours to numerous households, hundreds of households. And so many times people didn't know who the council people were. 
So I think it is in the interest of us getting out there and informing the public, talking about issues before the city. Uh, but these sort of signs, and, and the city's, you know, the police department's been encouraging the people to get these signs. And I think it has a stifling effect. It could have a stifling effect on, on political, you know, free speech and getting out there. So that's basically all I wanted to say. And uh, thank you for your time. The next speaker is John Stafford. Good evening, Council. John Stafford, 1401 Harvest Glen Drive. Many of you know me because I helped get you elected. Um, I read this ordinance, and as with Jeremy, I want to make sure that we cover political canvassing as an exemption here. Um, political speech is the bedrock basis of the First Amendment. It is the most precious of all speech, and the city cannot pass ordinances which stifle political speech. So I have given you all a copy of this amendment to the agenda or to this item that I would like you to add. And that is a um, definition of a political canvasser, which means any person working for a volunteer or volunteering for a candidate of a political office, a political party, a bond issue, a 501c4, a 527 organization, or a voter registration drive. And then on section 11144, we're just adding one sentence at the end that just says that this section does not apply to political canvassers because I know that even though you have told our canvassers not to knock on the doors of people who have no soliciting or no trespassing signs, that you get volunteers who are overzealous. And the last thing that we need is to have one of your volunteers get fined $500 because they knocked on the wrong person's door. So all I'm asking is add the one definition and add the one sentence at the end. So that way we have exempted political speech and we save the city from a potentially very expensive First Amendment lawsuit trying to defend this ordinance. And that's the main thing. Let's keep the cost to the city down. And that one paragraph and that one sentence at the end will save the city a lot of money. Thank you. The last speaker is Tom Adair. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, and City Staff. Um, Tom Adair, zip code is 75074, and I'm speaking to you tonight uh, as a former candidate, a, the Voting Rights Chairman of the Collin County Democratic Party, and as a lawyer. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you and City Staff for undertaking this work and reviewing the non-solicitation ordinance. Uh, I have spoken with several of you and staff about some concerns that I have had and others have had and that you've heard a little bit about tonight too. Um, and in particular, in light of recent or court rulings that have implicate the intersection of the freedom of speech and property rights. Uh, political canvassing is, at least Mr. Matthews said uh, a moment ago, is beneficial and has benefited many of many or all of you, and it also helps educate our citizens. So I do think there is a great value in that. Um, while I have some small concerns about how Plano residents will be educated about the change, I do believe that this ordinance is a very positive one and largely addresses the concerns that I have raised with some of you and with staff. Uh, I encourage that you pass it, but would encourage you to uh, consider a small amendment. Uh, I've just reviewed the amendment that was proposed and do think exempting uh, political canvassers from violations of the ordinance would be, uh, is one that I encourage you to make. Uh, I don't know any political candidate who wants their canvassers uh, knocking on doors that say no trespassing, but I have knocked on plenty of doors myself uh, before realizing there were signs saying that maybe canvassers weren't welcome. Uh, so I don't want any political canvassers to risk a citation and fine like that, uh, or if they're you know, too zealous or bold. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, I believe such an amendment to exempt 
political canvassers from such penalties would strengthen this ordinance against attacks that it is unconstitutional and because it restricts freedom of speech. Uh, to this end, by making such an amendment, the city might spare itself from unnecessary litigation and the associated legal costs. Thank you again for your work on this. I encourage you to pass this ordinance with that small amendment to help it pass constitutional muster. Thank you. Thank you. There are no other speakers on this item. Thank you. No, please. Mayor and Council, um, I'd like to address some of the comments that were made tonight, and I appreciate the input of the people that spoke. Um, there already exists in state law a Class B misdemeanor for criminal trespass. And what that means is as long as private property owners provide notice to the public to stay off their property, nobody can go on the property. There is no exception for anybody. As private property owners, you know you have the right to control who comes on your property. And so um, this, this um, Class C disregarding the no trespass sign was is already in the ordinance, but this one has been narrowed. It used to say no solicitation or any kind of like sign like that. Now we're really just saying if you have a no trespass or a no trespassing sign, and that's disregarded, that we will have also a Class C misdemeanor for that. And in talking with Police Chief Drain, who is here tonight, um, we feel like this gives police more tools to really um, enforce in a less harsh manner because under a class B misdemeanor, a canvasser can be arrested for disregarding the sign. And this gives p police tools to give warnings and then only write a citation that's in municipal court rather than just, you know, have it escalated to a potential arrest situation. And if you want to hear more from Chief Drain, and I see that my municipal prosecutor, my chief prosecutor and police legal advisor are here who are more versed in criminal law, they can further expand on that, on that issue. I will also say that if there is a desire not to have the Class C, which I think is not good for the canvassers because it subjects them to potential arrest instead of just the tickets, um, that we just come back and remove that provision because creating exceptions starts to create issues related to content-based, which then can really subject you to civil liability. And this is very content-neutral as it's written. So I'll hand the floor over to Chief Drain. Yeah, one of the things about the uh, Class B provision that Paige mentioned is that is a penal code violation and that penal code violation has a named victim, the property owner. So there are some things police officers have the discretion not to enforce, but if we've got a named victim, generally we have to, we have to file those charges, and then we would have to rely on the <clears throat> district attorney's office to decide if they didn't want to handle that. So I understand the issue with the Class C applying to political canvassers, but, but they would be exposed to a Class B in any case, as Paige pointed out. Uh, a couple of questions. Thank you very much, Chief Train. So if I'm understanding correctly, by passing, well, first, by revising this ordinance, we're basically taking no soliciting signs out, as exists in the current ordinance. We're just removing that from the equation completely. And then by creating this as a Class C, we're providing that as an insulating mechanism against a Class B, which is already under state statute. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And, and the reason that we sent out those signs that uh, Mr. Matthews showed o over our website is because we, were requ we received requests from citizens wanting to know what can I do about both commercial solicitors and political canvassers coming to the house. And so we said, well, you can put up at the time a no, no solicitation sign. Ours says no solicitation, no peddlers, no trespassing. And so that's the reason why we sent that out as an option for people who didn't want to be bothered. And that's why we sent that out. Now, of course, the no soliciting and no pedal provisions of that don't apply, you know, assuming this passes, but the no trespassing would apply. Okay, so if this passes as is, then if somebody has a um, no soliciting sign uh, posted on their property, 
It doesn't matter. Nobody, doesn't matter. nobody has to care about it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter in the case of door-to-door -door solicitors. Uh, it doesn't matter in the case of handbills. It has to say no trespassing. Okay, so... And it, and it applies to everybody. It applies to commercial, everybody. it applies to political, it applies to religious. And likewise, if we passed this um, without a penalty clause, or even just didn't pass anything, we just repealed our current ordinance and didn't pass anything, and instead, state law prohibiting trespassing, if a no trespassing sign is posted, still applies carrying with it a class B. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, then my final question regarding freedom of speech. Um, I understand that political content can't be regulated in speech, but can't the location of it, especially on private property, be regulated? I mean, I understand anybody has a right to say what they want politically, but do they have a right to say it at my front porch? No, and that I did see that misconception repeated frequently on social media during campaign season. As Chief said, they also got complaints at the police or inquiries at the police department. So um, the fact is that your First Amendment rights stop at my property line if I don't want you there. <laughs> so, and all I have to do under the law now is give you notice and assign us notice. So we're just trying to give the police more tools so that if a property owner says, I want an arrest, that maybe there's other options to, you know, write, I mean, a citation and not have as harsh of an enforcement when people innocently just don't see the sign or, you know, accidentally disregard. Okay. And I'm in agreement with the gentleman who spoke about not uh, exacting unnecessary punitive measures against uh, political canvassers who, and I've knocked on plenty of doors myself. Um, oftentimes somebody will say, didn't you see my sign? It's like that little weather-worn faded sticker in the bottom right corner of their uh, front door window. Like, no, I didn't. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as, a, as a matter of application, um, if somebody did complain about this to the police department under this, wh what kind of uh, steps would you actually undertake so that you, with those additional tools in your box so it doesn't go straight to a class B? Well, we would, uh, if, if, if someone calls us, <clears throat> we're, go we're going to respond. And, you know, a lot of people do have ring doorbells now or some kind of a camera system. And so the person ringed on their door, knocked on their door, maybe they spoke to them in person, and then they left. If the person can show us on video, it's the guy wearing the blue pants and the red shirt and the officer drives around and sees him, they make contact with them. How we generally handled those situations before was the permit provisions. Under this ordinance, the, the uh, permit provisions, the ID provisions, those have gone away. <clears throat> and if that home, and if we locate that person, we look at the video and that's them, we, not, we would not be able to do a custodial arrest because we did not see the offense. But we've got plenty for probable cause to go get a, to get a warrant and then have that person arrested later. It's, it's typically how that would work, if that's what the homeowner wanted. <clears throat> because just because a homeowner has a no trespassing sign, but their neighbor comes over to tell them they left their pool water on, obviously they're not going to you know, call us for trespassing. <clears throat> so, uh, Could, theoretically, a neighbor call because their a neighbor whom they have a tiff with came over to tell them their garage door was open or their <laughs> dogs were or any any number of reasons if they have a no trespassing sign if they've got a no trespassing sign and they hadn't been invited over they're in violation technically okay. it's not, and so you know amazon and things like that deliver we consider that invited yeah, but that's invited yeah um i was going to bring up another point but i don't remember right this one <laughs> <laughs> councilman riccadelli Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> while the city attorney thinks of that point, I, I did have a question because I know that uh, I'm not a criminal lawyer, but I know that most criminal laws require a culpable mental state. Right. If somebody genuinely didn't see a sign, especially if it's reasonable, as Councilmember Williams described, if it's a you know weather-worn, small, nondescript sign, and somebody says, I, I just didn't see that and had no intent to, um, you know, to knock on somebody's door who had a no trespassing sign, if, if they truthfully had no intent, are they going to meet the elements to be penalized under either the state Class B or the Class C that we're considering tonight? Yeah, and I think, uh, and I'm going to defer to our lawyers, I don't think the couple of middle state applies in this one, does it? it what I do remember what I was going to say, Council, is that, as the Chief is saying, you know, we had permit requirements in the ordinance where repealing and some other requirements and as it says in the preamble of the ordinance, 
repeatedly and consistently, the courts have been striking down these provisions as unconstitutional um, because they are content-based. So that's why we are repealing ours, and we're going to use tools in state law to address some of the concerns. And, and, you know, if the person says that, I mean, when they go to see to municipal court, they can bring that up as a defense that they didn't see the sign. Um, I, you know, the officers, if it meets the element of the offense, they go look and the sign should have been seen, then uh, and they can bring that up in municipal court that, well, I didn't see it, and it just becomes a matter for the court to decide. <clears throat> Did you want to say something on that? Hello, Michelle Vorin, Chief Prosecutor for the City of Plano. So in that's a good point that you bring up about mental culpability. In most higher level criminal offenses, you have to have a mental culpability of intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly, or criminal negligence, depending on how the statute is written. It's not unusual in Class C misdemeanors to have offenses that dispense with the criminal culpable mental, mental culpability. For example, speeding offenses, right? We don't have to prove that you saw the sign that told you what the speed limit was. We don't have to prove that you intentionally or knowingly disregarded that sign. We do have to prove that the signage was properly posted. So if, as long as you have proper uh, posting of the signs, and in our particular, this ordinance would require a conspicuous posting and there's a certain size for the sign, as long as it's properly posted, then we would not have to prove that you intended to disregard that sign. As in any criminal case, the defendant has a Fifth Amendment right not to testify. He doesn't have to tell us what's in his, what's in his head. So we would have to prove the posting of the sign. We would have to prove uh, that you intentionally entered the property. Um, but we wouldn't have to prove that, that you saw the sign, because we would not necessarily ever be able to prove that. But as with every other offense that comes to municipal court or in county or district court, we're going to listen to whatever the defense has to present to us, and that's something that we can take into consideration in our recommendation, just like police have discretion uh, when they're investigating to determine whether or not but they believe there's sufficient evidence for that element. Well, th thank you, Michelle, so much for that information. Uh, from a legal point of view, would there be any issue with adding a culpable mental state requirement to, to this? And, and, and does the state class B require a culpable mental state? Yeah, so when you look at culpable mental states, there are some offenses that are conduct-oriented and some that are result-oriented. So a culpable mental state uh, applies to the conduct. So think of what is the verb, what is the verb, the, the conduct that's prohibited. For this particular offense, it would be to enter the property. That's the conduct, to enter the property, right? So did you intentionally or knowingly enter the property? Well, yes, you did intentionally or knowingly enter the property. It's not, uh, you wouldn't be um, having a culpable mental state for seeing the sign, because as the chief said, that would be impossible to prove. How would I ever prove that you saw the sign? It's just like in a speeding case. I can never prove that you saw the speeding sign unless you confess. I can never prove that you looked at your speedometer. If we made that a requirement, I would never be able to convict somebody of speeding because you okay. could just say, Wait, I don't know. Can I, can I interrupt? The reality is I think it, that the chief operationally, and it's his decision, but I think they mostly go out and try to get cooperation just like we do in, in many areas that we regulate. And I don't believe we've had a ticket even under a current ordinance written since 2018. They go out and try to get people to cooperate, and it's just going to be the person that just completely refuses to, and you know, just repeatedly <laughs> says, I don't care, I'm going on there, I have a right to. That's the person that's going to get a ticket. So I, I, th I don't think we need yeah. to have a okay. long discussion about that piece of it. That makes sense. Um, I'm just wondering if there might be some unintended consequences to the signs as, as they're created now. Like you said, there's some people that complain about people selling them things and others about political canvassers. And my experience, while canvassing was that I came across a lot of people that were surprised I was at their door and, and welcomed the conversation. And are we stifling that opportunity to get information about candidates and for candidates to be able to communicate? I'm wondering, I'm just throwing it out, could there be an option for a sign that says political uh, candidates welcome or something so there's not that, that accidental unintended it, it, consequence? You know, if we were to do that, we would be regulating content, and that's what we can't do. So we can't regulate content and say this content is okay 
but this content is not. I mean, that's going to be a violation of the Gilbert case, the uh, Reed versus Gilbert case that led to all of this in 2015, okay. and that's going to be a classic violation of that. And and then we would be exposed to litigation. And and I understand, uh, Mr. Adair and I have talked about this 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 case before, and and I understand the possible. I'm getting out over my skis talking about litigation, but but I am concerned about it. And uh, my, our officers arresting someone for a class B is much greater than writing them a citation for a class C. You know that's not a custodial arrest. And so uh, so I, I really encourage you if we're going to pass this, I really believe that we have to have the class C provision in there, or we're gonna it's gonna it's gonna get down the road. We don't do many, but we don't have many other options now. We don't have permits or anything else to look at, and an officer has the elements of the offense for that. They can make that arrest, you know, or they can go get that a warrant and make that arrest. And and I don't think any of us want that to happen for someone who's just political canvassing. So I think it's really important that we have the class C provision, and there's no way that we can strike out and leave and 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 exempt uh, political canvassers from that. I'm satisfied with that answer. The only other um, comment that I'd like to make is that we really make sure we take the time to educate through the schools, I mean, the school officers. My son, I know, is a place football, and he was sent out to go sell something door to door. And I said, did they tell you not to knock on doors that said don't trespass or no soliciting? And he said, no, they didn't give us any kind of guidance. So maybe make sure that we're doing education with the, the scouts and the girls, you know, the all those clubs just to make sure that. Uh, they're educated about Mine that. says no trespassing, Girl Scout, cookie sellers are welcome, though. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Shelby. Um, a question just occurred to me. Um, if the offense is setting foot on the property, but you don't know there's a no trespassing sign until you're at or near the entrance and reading the two-thirds of an inch letters, is there a provision in law for not realizing you've violated the no trespassing sign until you've seen the no trespassing sign after which it's too late? Well, I, I, and I think that's one where the officer, looking at the video, if it wasn't evident that they could see that sign from where they were at that portion of the yard, then uh, you know, I don't think that they would, they, would, they would meet the criteria for writing them a citation. I, I agree with the chief. So do I have my sign down by my, you know, where my property line starts by the sidewalk or do I have it at my door? You know, it's where, where, where are you meeting that sign? That's probably going to be part of the fact equation about how that's evaluated. Okay. Just want to make sure. Councilman Smith. Th thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I want to say I think our, our legal staff has done a, a great job crafting this because it applies equally to everyone. There's no exclusions or no ifs, ands, or buts. And if I heard everything correctly, we have lessened the potential penalty from being a, an arrestable offense uh, at the time to really giving the officer's discretion to look at the situation. So in you know, Council Member Williams' you know, uh, analogy, if somebody just walks up and see it, you'll see, they'll go, oh, and turn around and walk away. So obviously the officer will see if it's on a ring or whatever can make a determination, oh, that they really didn't intend to do that. So so based on what I've heard, uh, I'd make a motion to, to approve consent uh, item U as as uh, presented. Okay. I second. I have a motion, a second, to approve uh, consent agenda item U. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to uh, individual items for consideration. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, the length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests are received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one. Consideration of an ordinance to repeal ordinance number 2016-6-25 
codified as Chapter 4, Animal Regulations of the City of Plano, Code of Ordinances, and adopting a new Chapter 4, Animal Regulations of the City of Plano, Code of Ordinances, and providing a repealer clause, a severability clause, a savings clause, a penalty clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Uh, good evening, Council. This is um, uh, the biggest changes that we have in our ordinances uh, deal with the backyard chickens um, that we discussed earlier. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention in that is that um, our ordinances do not supersede any HOA rules or deed restrictions or other covenants that may prohibit um, uh, uh, chickens on a property. Um, but for us, um, we basically have clarified um, several things in our ordinances based on cases that we've dealt with recently. Um, we also made some changes due to um, issues that we saw during uh, recent um, extreme weather events. Um, and so we've just tried to make sure that our ordinances were in line with state law and, and as clear as possible. Um, so everything that we've changed essentially a, a average pet owner in Plano will have no additional regulation or less regulation than what they uh, currently have um, and it really is just the very it fine-tuning of some of the language that we have to make sure that uh, we are uh, clear and and easy to understand in in all cases so do I have any questions about anything with that sure any questions for staff on the uh, on the ordinance all right thank you thank you Chair. Uh, we have speakers I we believe. do have speakers we have five the first one is ember chafin followed by kaylin connor hello council i want to first off saying say thank you this has been a year um, it was just about a year, a little over a year since um, we kind of had this initial discussion. So I first just wanted to say thank you on behalf of the Plano Hens Group. I also want to say thank you to Jamie who spent a very long meeting with us to um, really explain this ordinance in depth to ensure that we were kind of all on board and, and that um, this is what the uh, kind of those of us in Plano who have gotten together and want hens, um, that you know the ordinance it made sense both for the safety of the animals, but also um, thinking about our neighbors as well as um, the individual property rights. So uh, just on behalf of that, I did wanna say the Plano Hens uh, Facebook group supports this ordinance and is again, I'm very thankful that we have gotten to this point. So thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Kaylin Connors, which is on Zoom. Go ahead, Kaylin. Uh, yes, thank you everyone for taking the time and, and uh, thank you all for considering this um, ordinance change. Uh, I, I, for one, think that uh, backyard uh, hens, specifically not chickens, but hens, uh, are, are incredibly important, but also it's super important to allow uh, pup property owners to, to be able to do with what they want within bounds uh, on their property. Um, thank you so much for, for uh, thinking about this and for considering it. Um, I'd like to uh, voice my, my support of this ordinance change. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Adam Sablich, followed by John Stafford. Adam Sablik, uh, Huntington Drive. Uh, you saw me at the last meeting, um, and we did not expect all this extra support today. We didn't uh, get these people you know, up here, but it's great to see. Uh, like Ember said, it was fantastic working with Mr. Cantrell in Animal Services. He's done an excellent job uh, putting together an ordinance that we all agreed on um, that should be beneficial for the city of Plano, that is extremely um, caring of the safety of, of hens potentially, as well as keeping uh, nuisance down for neighbors. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic. And again, just here to register my support. Thank you. Thank you. John Stafford. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
we'll move on to Richard Wells. Oh, there's Mr. Stafford. <laughs> So, John Stafford doesn't want backyard chickens, but Julia Stafford does want backyard chickens. <laughs> and she spent two hours this afternoon exp explaining to me where she wants to put the coop in the yard, how she wants to take care of them, how she wants to design them. And when Julia Stafford wants something, well, that's really what's the important thing in the household. So, I'm asking all of you to make Julia Stafford happy and pass this ordinance so that Julia Stafford can have what she wants to have in the yard. Thank you. Uh, Richard Wells, Wells Brothers Pet Lawn and Garden Center. Uh, just want to thank you all for considering this. I know there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of um, research and a lot of hard work from staff and um, we appreciate all that. We are here to assist in any way we can and to help chicken owners fully understand their responsibilities and what they are getting into so that they don't, animal control doesn't wind up with the problems later on. So if there's anything else we can do, and he's been great. Uh, we've had several telephone conversations and like I said, anything we can do to help him, we are gonna uh, continue forward with education for potential owners and uh, anything we can do for y'all just let me know thank you very much thanks Richard there are no other other speakers on this item but in addition to the speakers we had 56 people register an opinion of support and 98 register as an opinion of opposition Mayor Pro Tem. I'll just say that we've been working on this a very long time, as many speakers said, and I want to um, thank um, our director of animal services over here for his diligent work on this. Um, I feel, I've said many times, I feel that it's a, a um, property rights issue and that many of our other cities around us have done this and shown that they can do it well without having a nuisance to their neighbors. And so I think that we've always done things well in Plano and that this will be no different. And so I'd make a motion to approve. Second. Does that mean cluck yes? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have that removed later. <laughs> No, no, we won't because of open records. Yeah. <laughs> I have a motion to second. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Oh, um, I'll get to you, Julie. I, I do know that in a previous discussion, um, it was reported by the mass media uh, that I was in support and it was a unanimous support of this issue. Let me correct the record. I am not. Um, I am not in support of backyard chickens, and I'm speaking on the experience of being um, a farm kid from a long time ago and dealing with chickens all the time. I, I personally feel um, that the ordinance has been written extremely well, and um, I really commend the staff, um, and I commend the uh, animal support uh, committee uh, the advisory committee on all of the work that they have done, but I can't support this. We talk about it as being a property rights with about 200 homeowners that would like chickens in their backyard and forget all about 73,000 and eight other 73,800 other homeowners that may not want to have chickens in their backyard, and it's their property right that I am concerned about. Um, I also can't support it from the standpoint of the expansion and need of personnel and equipment and, and housing for the chickens that will be abandoned to our own animal shelter. I would rather spend that money on expanding the, the equipment and the building and the personnel at the animal shelter for things that are really needed like dogs and cats and kittens and puppies and other things that are brought to the shelter on a daily basis where we have at times overcrowding. So I think that although we have spent a significant amount of time 
and a significant amount of money and are talking about spending more money. To me, it is a waste of taxpayer money that we are doing on this particular issue. I do know that I am in the absolute minority here and I will lose all of the poultry political votes on this issue. <laughs> but I will also say this, that I can go to a store today and I can get a dozen eggs for about $1.39. My guess is you're going to find that you're not going to be raising a $1.39 dozen eggs um, by having chickens in your backyard. I understand that they are a pet uh, or they may be a pet. If you are going to eat them, because I have heard people talking about I'm, I'm going to be raising them for the meat, then raise them for the meat because you're not going to get eggs if you're raising them for the meat because you're going to be slaughtering them before they are eggers. Um, and if they're after eggers, they're going to be stewers because they're going to be too tough to eat. Sell them to Campbell Soup. Um, but I will tell you this, that I just think that although you think that this is going to be a real joy, it is hard work because kiss goodbye the vacations unless you have a chicken babysitter <laughs> because you need to take care of chickens every single day and that's the way it is with livestock you cannot neglect them for a week you cannot neglect them for two weeks or even over a weekend you have got to take care of them all the time so the burden is on the individuals and i personally cannot support this um, by any means because of the other property owners that I feel that this inflicts harm on. Councilman Holman. Councilwoman Holman. My, my in-laws have chickens, and like Mr. Grady mentioned, they, they are pets to a lot of people. They're not just for the eggs. Or don't just... name them. If you're going to eat them, don't name them. No, don't name them, yeah. Nobody wants well, to eat Betty. And, and most people I know that, that are interested do want to also keep them as pets. Um, I did speak with the Heritage Farmstead, and they support the ordinance to allow residents to own chickens in Plano. The museum has successfully housed chickens for educational purposes at the museum for over 45 years with no major issues, and they're happy to provide care tips. I would encourage anybody who's thinking about getting a chicken to get over to that Heritage Farmstead. They are willing to offer quarterly classes. I appreciate Mr. Wells for being willing to give education. I would not go into this lightly before making an investment and a commitment to having an animal in your yard. I would encourage you to, to get educated and get with someone that already has hens and get the experience um, for yourself firsthand before taking that next step. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention that the farmstead is already at capacity. So if you think that maybe you decide you don't want your chicken and you can take it to the farm for them to take it, that's not an option. I do appreciate um, all the work that um, that Jamie's done and his team has done, and I I, I applaud the community working together with Plano Hens. Uh, again, Mr. Wells getting involved uh, to do this, and so I, I am in support of this. Thank you. So we have a motion, a second. Any other comments? Please vote. Motion passes seven to one. <laughs> Item two. Item two, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2021-20 to amend Article 8 definitions, Article 9 residential districts, Article 13 lot and building standards and related sections of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance of the City, Ordinance Number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended, pertaining to backyard chickens, and providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. This item was tabled at the September 13th meeting. Right, this is part two of the backyard chickens. Uh, so we did need to amend the zoning ordinance pertaining to backyard chickens because there are some parts of the zoning ordinance that would, that relate to, to chickens. So we had this up earlier when I know uh, Mr. Cantrell was trying to give his presentation and of course, um, It was in preliminary. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Great. Well, now thank you for helping me find that. There we go. Perfect. All right. So um, this is again, like I said, a companion to agenda item one. 
and also to the preliminary open meeting agenda item six, um, where, um, again, Mr. Cantrell discussed um, the uh, amendment to allow backyard hens, as has been discussed extensively. The zoning ordinance, again, does impact the keeping of backyard hens. So we've kind of scoured the zoning ordinance to see how that would impact based on council's direction, and we found really three elements that needed to be changed. First was the uh, ordinance change in the code of ordinance that talked about the sale of backyard hen byproducts, um, such as eggs, and so that you might not, this is a little interesting, but it impact accessory buildings, um, and so we had to change the, our accessory building regulations. Um, also, the change of language in the estate development district because that is a uh, restricted foul explicitly in the language of that zoning district. And then we also found a use with the way the uh, kennel use was defined. Um, that uh, definition in the zoning ordinance specifically thought there could be some conflicts there because of the way animals were housed and thought that that could be utilized to cause a conflict. So that's where we found um, found some changes necessary. So looking at the comprehensive plan, we found three elements that we thought supported, and those are listed here if there is interest in comp plan support. So again, Kennel uses, accessory building regulations, and the estate development district are all proposed to be changed. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval by a vote of eight to zero. And again, subject to the changes that council just approved and uh, as noted in the staff report, and we are available for questions you might have. Thanks, Christina. Any questions for staff? All right. I'll open the public hearing. There are no speakers on this item. All right. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Confine the comments to the council. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve item number two. Please vote. I'm not Anthony. It's okay. Is there a pun? <laughs> no, no, no puns. I'm out. Yeah, but you're um, I just want to um, uh, I want to thank uh, Jamie and uh, Christina and staff not only for working to create this ordinance, but also Christina and uh, everybody else involved. Our code of ordinances is even longer than the Texas Constitution, and that's saying something. And so it could not have been an easy task to make sure that everything was tightened up and in alignment. So uh, well done on the effort. Thank you. Item number three, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2021-12 to amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2, as heretofore amended, so as to amend plan development 472 corridor commercial on 10.9 acres of land located at the southwest corner of U.S. Highway 75 and the 13th 14th connector in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, in order to modify the adopted site plan and development standards, directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city and providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Applicant HD Development Properties LP and SCSD Finnell Management LLC. On that last item, I think I just jumped right into backyard hens and forgot to say I'm Christina Day, Director of Planning. <laughs> so, um, good evening. <laughs> yes. Um, so, this next zoning case, 2021 12, is a sort of unique plan development district. We don't have many in town uh, that where the site plan is adopted by ordinance, but this is one of those unique districts. So it is located along US 75 and at the 13th, 14th connector. Um, it is just west of the uh, general residential district and within the corridor commercial zoning district. Um, as you can see uh, on the aerial photograph before you, 
there are residential uses generally to the north and east and commercial uses to the south and west. Um, and then uh, US Highway 75 is a primary feature as well. So here's a photograph from Google Maps showing the east side of the site um, because that's where a building expansion is planned. Um, there are three prim primary features to this request. Um, first of all is this building expansion, again, on the east side of the existing Home Depot building. Um, first of all, residential setbacks that would normally apply to superstores don't apply to this site because of some timing issues. It was built prior to those restrictions in our ordinance. Um, they also have agreed there will be no cleaning of materials on site. Um, with regard to the tool rental expansion that they're planning. And the existing screening wall that you see in this picture, just where the stop sign is located, there's a, a masonry screening wall there and a, a row of mature trees. And um, you can see that those are deciduous trees, but um, they are large. Um, those will remain um, and fairly effectively screen where that building will expand. So there also the second element of the request is to really uh, address some open storage needs on site. The primary needs are with existing open storage and it's mostly seasonal open storage where they have overflow of um, needs that come onto the site with semi trucks that have deliveries and then they need to stack them as they're loading them into the store. So you see on the north side of the building, which is kind of to the left, um, those areas that they're adding for storage that are really currently used today for, for storage. And so it's really bringing that site into compliance. And then at the upper part of the screen, that is where they're adding storage for the tool rental facility that they're planning to add to provide additional services to the community. The northern portion will be screened by the existing screening wall, and then they're uh, planning to add some additional landscaping and allow the landscaping that's there to fill in to screen on the north side of the building. So the third and final element is the addition of compact construction equipment. So the kind of blue box that you see uh, designated um, this is just on the north side of the pad site, the restaurant that was recently added to this area. That's where the compact construction equipment will be in those designated parking spaces. So they're designating 10 spaces for that equipment. And it is outside of the um, adjacency requirements by being 180 feet away from the residential zoning district boundary and again screened by the masonry screening wall. So this does comply with the comprehensive plan. It's in a freeway commercial district and based on the existing screening it, and meeting the required setbacks, it does comply with the comprehensive plan. We received one letter of opposition within the 200 foot boundary. And that we also received one letter of, uh, that was positive in support. And that was just at the edge of the 500 foot notice boundary. Those were the only responses we received for a total of two responses on for this case. So you'll see there is one text amendment being proposed as well, and that's to ensure compliance uh, with the existing screening to the north of the building. So the language is shown on the screen um, saying that screening may be placed within the building setback adjacent to 13th, 14th connector. Here's the site plan as proposed because it's adopted again as part of the plan. And with that, the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval uh, by a vote of eight to zero, and we are available for questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff?
I'll open the public hearing. Would the applicant like to address the commission, uh, council? Yes, they are on Zoom, so let me get them brought into the party. Janae, you can unmute and go ahead. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I am, uh, my name is Janae Momer. We are uh, site development coordinators for Home Depot with uh, Lars Anderson and Associates, Inc. Uh, we have uh, reviewed the staff report and conditions and uh, we are accepted to them and uh, just would like to thank the planning staff for all the work on this project and I can answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Do we have any Thank speakers you. cards? We do not. All right. Seeing none, I'll close the item. Combine the comments to the council. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second. <laughs> All right. I did. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a motion and a second to approve agenda item number three. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Next item. Item number four, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as request, requested in zoning case 2021-21 to amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended. Granting specific use permit number 186 for new vehicle dealer on 0.1 acre of land located 14 feet west of Windrose Avenue and 197 feet south of Winthrop Street in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas. Presently zoned Plan Development 65 Central Business 1, directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city and providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Applicant Legacy West Investors LP. Zoning case 2121 is entirely within plan development 65 central business one, which is within uh, legacy West. Um, it is 0 0.1 acre lease space. You can see on the aerial that it encompasses both a building and a parking garage within the area of the specific use permit request. So it is proposing a new vehicle dealer use. Um, there is an existing new vehicle dealer use also existing in this area. And so the associated cars will be parked both in the showroom within the building space and in the parking spaces in the parking garage. Um, it will be limited by a stipulation that will restrict a maximum inventory to nine vehicles on the site. It is compliant with the comprehensive plan showing major corridor development and also with the economic development element of the comprehensive plan. We had no responses to this request. And so with that, the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval. Uh, by a vote of eight to zero, and we are available for questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Councilman Smith? Wait a minute. I just have one. I know this is another electric vehicle dealer. Which uh, one is this? It's Lucid. It is Lucid. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'll open the public hearing. Would the applicant like to address the commit uh, council? I've said that twice. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us. Mr. Mayor, council members, and city staff, thank you. Um, I'm here to represent Lucid. My name is Steve Merkel, 2817 Amherst, Dallas, Texas. Wanted to give you guys a little bit of a brief uh, presentation on Lucid, the group, and who we are as a company. So 
I will flip through some slides. This is who we are. We're an American um, automotive company specializing in electric vehicles based in Newark, California, close to San Jose. We've opened about um, 15 stores so far, 15 galleries, and we uh, looked to open some more, and you know, we found this opportunity in Legacy West and are very excited about it. It's a great development you guys have. A little bit about the company again. It's, um, you know, we want to provide more options for electric vehicles, and we have some pretty fantastic cars about to hit the road. This is the first car we're going to produce, and this car, um, the Lucid Air, will be in the Legacy West unit. They'll be um, one of the vehicles within the premises, and then we plan to have a few more that people can touch and feel outside. If you guys have any questions, let me know. The EPA just certified a certified a 520 mile battery, um, which is is pretty amazing. This is one of our studios here. This is in Century City in Los Angeles. Gives you a little bit of feel for what um, some of the galleries look like. Legacy West will be customized. We'll get into the specifics here in a minute, but this is a representation of what we've done elsewhere. It's a, a very elegant look. You'll see pretty soft materials, you know, really nice build out. Again, a little bit more on the, the studio. You can go in, you can look at, you know, specific features um, of the car. You know, we'll educate you. You can look at different interiors and things like that. That's the, uh, the specific opportunity. You guys might know it. It's the former Barnes & Noble space. It's, it's a piece of it. It's about 3,800 square feet. It's the uh, lease outline drawing of the space. This is the outdoor area where we'll park the cars and have charging stations. It's somewhat similar to what Tesla's done there, if you guys are familiar with that. That is a rendering of, um, of the storefront. We're going to pop it out and um, you know add some glass, and it'll look pretty sharp. Again, the car. These are renderings of this specific store. You see it's a little bit different than what we did in California. It's a little uh, softer and lighter. I think it fits in a little better with the development itself. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Any, uh, any questions for the applicant? I have one. Did do you have one model or do you have several models? We do. We, we really have one car right now. Okay. And there's different configurations, you know, different engines, yeah. different things like that that you can you can uh, purchase. But we'll have some more soon. <laughs> I, I was just curious. I didn't know how many, you know, whether you had to have several models in the showroom or, or just the one. Yeah, there's just the Air for now. That's okay. our first car. And like I said, you can add different configurations. There's different models of it for different prices that you can configure. But we'll probably have some more soon. Thank you. That's the plan. Appreciate it. Do you have any speakers? I'm sorry, did anybody have any other questions? Speakers? No other speakers on this item. All right. Seeing none, we'll close the item and find the comments to council. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. I have a motion, a second to approve agenda item number four. Please vote. <laughs> Go. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Next item. Item number five. Public hearing and consideration of a resolution to approve the terms and conditions <laughs> of an interlocal agreement and memorandum of understanding buying between the City of Plano, the City of McKinney, the City of Frisco, and the Collin County Sheriff's Office for the disbursement of the 2021 Edward Byrne Justice Assistant Grant Funds and authorizing its execution by the City Manager and providing an effective date. Uh, 
Hello, Council. Uh, this grant does require a, a public meeting. Uh, this grant is a Department of Justice grant that we have been getting for, for several years. It's based off of our, of our Part 1 um, uh, violent crime. We, we are partnering this grant. Initially, it was with the Collin County Sheriff's Office. Uh, and now, uh, in recent years, we've added the city of McKinney and the city of Frisco. So we split the proceeds of that. Uh, we are the fiscal agent for this grant. The city of Plano is. And uh, we each come up with a project every year. And then we decide, uh, you know, what we're going to spend this money on. In this case, I believe we're going to get it. We're going to spend the, the funds on um, during the, the protest. There were some lasers that were blinding some officers in some locations. So we're looking to get lasers protection uh, sunglasses for our officers in case we get into that environment again. Do you have any questions about it? This is a formula grant. It's not anything we have to compete for. Uh, we're going to get it every year. Any questions for Chief? Thank are you. they stylish? Do they? Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. As long as, <laughs> as, long, as, long as they uh, work as designed, I'm, I'm happy. With okay. This. All right. Thank you. Well, that being said, I'll open the public hearing. Any speakers? There are no speakers. All right. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. <laughs> I have a motion and a second to approve a, agenda item number five. Please vote. <laughs> You're doing good. <laughs> the motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Next item. <laughs> Getting so close. Item number six, public hearing and consideration of a resolution to approve the use or taking of a portion of City of Plano public parkland known as Shell Park pursuant to Chapter 26 of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Code for the dedication of parkland as a permanent utility easement for the purpose of water and storm water sewer storm sewer excuse me storm sewer improvements located on our avenue between puma and jasmine lane authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents and providing an effective date good evening council my name is ron smith parks and recreation director we do have a request from the city's engineering department for storm sewer and potable water easement at shell park Project is located near the intersection of Jasmine Lane and R Avenue along the western limits of Shell Park. Since Shell Park is public park land, it is protected by Chapter 26 of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Code, which requires a public hearing. Two items that the council needs to find during the course of this public hearing. Number one, that there is no feasible and prudent alternative to the use of the taking and number two, that the project includes all reasonable planning to minimize harm to the public park. Staff has reviewed this project and we do believe that it complies with these two requirements. The project was also reviewed by the Parks and Recreation Planning Board and they concur with staff's assessment. Since the city of Plano is the applicant, Matt Yeager, the city's real estate manager, will present the case for the hearing. Good evening, Council. As Mr. Smith just said, I am Matthew Yeager, the city's real estate manager. Shell Park is located in East Plano. Uh, as you can see from the map in front of you here, it is bordered on the east by Jupiter Road, uh, on the south by Laurel Lane, on the west by R Avenue, and out of the picture here, uh, Moore Lane is the northern boundary there. It's a 25-acre uh, community park. This was acquired in the 1970s and developed uh, borders neighborhoods that were developed in the late 1960s, which is going to be important here in a moment. And we are here tonight because of the need to do storm sewer line work and to replace a water line that is running along our avenue. This is a closer view of the actual area to be considered as part of the project. The water line easement, as you can see, is on the northern end there. That's just short of 2,000 square feet. Uh, the drainage easement is further south in orange uh, in the photo. Uh, what you'll see there is it's taking stormwater from Jasmine Lane to a new outfall into the creek line there. Some photos to familiarize yourself with the current uh, configuration of the area. As Dr. Smith already alluded to, uh, there are two findings that need to be established tonight. 
One is that there's no feasible and prudent alternative to the using this parkland for the storm sewer work and the water work. Uh, the second being that due, plan uh, due planning has occurred to minimize harm to the park. Uh, towards the end of the first requirement, no feasible and prudent alternative, the existing water line was developed in conjunction with the, new, with the uh, development of the residential area, so it was constructed in the 1970s. In the red there, you can see a culvert crossing uh, across our avenue. So rather than redo and uh, undertake additional expense to bury the water line within that culvert, uh, this sewer easement to the east of our avenue allows it to jut out uh, slightly onto park property, approximately seven feet, uh, towards uh, getting across the creek, then crossing that driveway onto uh, the parking lot, then back to our avenue. Uh, it's gonna be replacing an iron water line with an up-to-date PVC new infrastructure. Uh, for the drainage easement, the orange there on the south, uh, the neighborhood is not currently adequately served by the existing storm sewers, so there is a need to install a second storm sewer line within uh, the right-of-way. When you take on additional water, it needs to go somewhere. The current creek uh, outfall is by the red culvert crossing right now. Uh, there's a need to have water actually go out in multiple locations there. Hence, the orange easement, which will take water approximately 60 feet from the right-of-way line into the existing creek there on park property. Towards the reasonable planning to minimize harm considerations, our engineering and, public and parks and recreation departments have coordinated. Uh, we've had the parks planners review the plans and sign off on them. No impact to the trees or irrigation systems within the park. Uh, replacement of the existing trail and parking lot are baked into the project and will occur so that it will be restored to its prior condition. Same thing with the turf grasses that might be disturbed by installing those uh, storm sewer and water lines. Uh, Long term looking at it, since these are below grade underground lines, your park users won't notice them on a day-to-day -day basis and they're located well away from the playground, the uh, ball fields and any other parts that are really gonna be heavily used here. So those are the two elements. Uh, no feasible and prudent alternative. It's, we could not find better places to put these things in the park, unfortunately. And then uh, reasonable planning has occurred between our staffs in our various departments. Thank you. Any questions for staff? It may seem like a really stupid question, but I wanted to ask, how long would it take to um, make sure that that area will be securely blocked so it doesn't um, become a hazardous area for people who are going to the park? How long? Yeah, how long is the process in, in putting in? Oh, sure. It, approximately one to two months. Um, and uh, the barriers to uh, while the excavation work is undertaken will be installed as part of the contract. And staff normally file safety plans to make sure that there's appropriate barriers up, notification signs like that, so that uh, uh, the public is aware of construction going on in the area. We want to make sure that everybody can avoid that, if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll open the public hearing. Any speakers' cards? There are no speakers on uh, this item. Close the public hearing. Confine the comments to the council. I will say that... Uh, I played Little League Baseball on those fields, and that was a long time ago, so I can guarantee you those pipes are really old. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have a motion? Motion to approve, just because the pipes are old. Yeah. <laughs> second. Yeah. I have a motion and a second to approve agenda item number six. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Next item. Next item. Item number seven, consideration of a resolution to adopt a policy requiring the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Plano City Council to make findings when approving certain zoning petitions within the City of Plano, establishing the basis for such findings and providing an effective date. This item is uh, the result of 
the direction at the last preliminary open meeting, uh, replacing a uh, direction from the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee. So we're here available for questions or any discussion of the resolution. Thank you. No. Yes, we have uh, Dan Sefko, who's our planning consultant with the committee, as well as Mike Bell, Comprehensive Planning Manager. Thank you. Any questions uh, for staff? Any clarifications? Uh, any motion? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I did. Uh, I did have a quick question for staff. Uh, I noted in the uh, resolution, and this was, uh, I think, a result of the council direction at the last meeting. There's a requirement for findings from the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission uh, should they recommend approval of uh, a zoning case that does not conform to certain aspects of the comprehensive plan, uh, the same for council in approving one. Um, there was not a, a requirement for staff to provide findings in recommending approval of, um, of, of a, a zoning case that might not be in conformity with the comprehensive plan. Uh, in practice, I think staff would always do that if there was a reason to make an exception from the comprehensive plan. So I was wondering what uh, staff thoughts were on including that to make the findings consistent through the uh, process. The reason we were really just basing the language on the language of the action item, and the action item uh, talked about council adopting an ordinance or policy that talked about identification of specific findings, and and since you know it talks about the city manager being empowered to implement the resolution as part of the normal business practice, that could be an area where um, we do include something like that. But if you're more comfortable with something think, along think, those can lines. Can I interrupt? Yeah. I think it's, okay. you know, staff staff does provide their report and you do go through the elements of the plan that you're relying on yeah. for your recommendation. And staff is also not decision making. So I think the idea is to have decision makers <clears throat> create findings in certain circumstances of what portions of the plan they're relying on to make those decisions. And I'd really like us to get away from the terminology not following the plan because we do follow our plan. <laughs> but what, how people weigh different elements of the plan or reconcile inconsistencies or conflicts in the plan may be viewed differently by different decision makers and also by staff. So I think that... <laughs> The reason it doesn't apply to staff is because they're not decision makers. Well, and that's been great. Uh, Fair enough. I, I'd like to suggest oh. that in, in staff's reports, we do make specific. I would suggest that any time we do recommend approval, you should and always always should find specific recommendations laid out as to why. If that, to me, we should always be making our, a strong case as to why we're recommending approval. Absolutely. And if I may just quickly clarify, the staff does always do that. I was just talking about whether it should be in the resolution or ordinance or, or not, but but absolutely, it's always been my experience that the staff does that. Well, so thank it's, you. it's critical that yeah. we we know where staff is on, on yeah. a, a, a case. Yeah. Councilman Grady. Um, Christina, and my, my questioning is a little bit in the same alignment, but a little bit different. Um, first, I believe after reading the ordinance and what we have put together here, um, that it is wording that is acceptable by um, the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee and probably has been looked at and, and commented back as to whether or not they feel that this is something they, they find necessary. I realize that I believe it was called RGM2 um, that we found that the it was really necessary to make this a, a part of a city ordinance rather than having it part of a comprehensive plan. And therefore, they found this to be the best path forward. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so they're in agreement with it. Um, planning and zoning appear to be in agreement with everything as well. I, I sent this language specifically to the chair and vice chair of the 
comprehensive plan review committee and the the because the planning and zoning commission had already voted to exclude this from the plan i think there was already a vote from pnz but the comprehensive plan review committee had not voted so i sent that to the comprehensive plan review committee's chair and vice chair for them to circulate it amongst their members and heard back positive feedback from them okay yeah i am in in, in full support of it being the type of ordinance that is requiring planning and zoning to pay attention to and the city council to pay attention to i do not believe that as the as our counselor was indicating that we need to wrap city staff into this because you come together and you look at the plan and you make recommendations off of the comprehensive plan and are saying this conforms or it doesn't conform and if it conforms why and if it doesn't conform why and if it is something that is a little bit out of the ordinary and you feel that we could make an adjustment you then explain why that adjustment is so i don't believe it should capture the staff i do believe it should capture the planning and zoning and i believe it should capture the council that we have to we have to have specific findings as to why we're going to approve something that is not designed within the plan so that's all i wanted to say mr mayor thank you yes thank you uh paige i understand a version of this has been drafted as an ordinance um you want to speak to that well, um, we know that there was some um, debate among CPRC and PNZ about, at different points, about whether this should be an ordinance or whether this should be a resolution. And legally, um, it, it would be applied the same whether it's a resolution or an ordinance. And we heard that mentioned also both things mentioned last time when we received direction but we put a resolution in the packet but we also have an ordinance for um council to consider if they prefer to adopt it as an ordinance it's substantively the same and um where it would be placed is in the code of ordinances in the section of the code of ordinances for the planning and zoning um, regulations uh, christina do you have that draft Beat me to it. Thanks. So, um, Councilman Williams, if council chooses to adopt this by ordinance, you can just swap out the ordinance for this resolution tonight. It's substantively the same. Okay. Um, how would I, because we're posted for the resolution, how would I have to make that as a motion? That you want to amend the resolution to be an ordinance and you want to adopt the ordinance staff proposed that was handed out at the dais okay then and uh, please can... correct me if i trip over this okay <clears throat> um uh, i would like to move that we amend the proposed resolution as an ordinance with the copy that staff has furnished us at the dais second that motion Counts Councilwoman I, homer i guess i just don't understand the purpose can you explain shelby what the, if there's not a difference Oh, sure. Um, from what I understand, as Paige uh, said a moment ago, um, the as an ordinance, it's actually registered into the city's code of ordinance uh, as a resolution and carries with it just the, I guess, the additional psychological weight. As a resolution, it's only recorded in the minutes of the meeting and in our minds and our hearts. I mean, staff has no objection to it being an ordinance. It's, I was just trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. The difference is it will be codified. Oh, 
Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, I just Rick thank you. I, I just wanted to ask a, a question. In in reviewing this, it looks like the um, section sixteen dash four A and B that track uh, what were sections one and two of the resolution. Uh, when they say must propose specific findings to the city council, the version drafted as an ordinance truncates there. The resolution appears to go on to say that we'll explain why they recommend approval under these circumstances, or in the case of section two, that we'll explain why they approve under these circumstances. Uh, I was wondering if there was a reason for the omission of that language from the ordinance, or if we could add that back in, because I think that provides guidance as to what type of uh, findings we're talking about, and it was uh, language that was in the resolution. Would you like to make a motion to amend the amendment? Uh, <laughs> if that's proper procedure, no, I guess. No, no, no. I want to hear the explanation, please. Yeah, yeah please. I'm, I'm it was just, just a matter of cross versions. Oh, I want to make sure I'm finding where we're talking about. I think that this must make specific. Under the printout, what Councilman Riccadelli is referring to yeah. would be at the ends of 16-4, Section A and B. I, I think it. this was a, in the resolution, that was a addition that occurred late in the week. And I think when legal drafted the ordinance, that that was not something we didn't pick up on that change in the ordinance would be my okay. suggestion. So it's just a inadvertent omission. It's okay to okay. add it back, like you said. How would we have to handle this page? Would he be able to make an amendment to the amendment or should mm -hmm. I withdraw my original motion and restate it? Whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, there I'm gonna go. try to remember all this now. <laughs> uh, I withdraw my original motion and I'll make a new motion to amend okay. the resolution as an ordinance um, as proposed or per the printout provided by staff on the dais with the amended language to add um, <coughs> quote that will explain why they recommend approval under these circumstances to the ends of both sections 16-4a and b and i will second that change in the motion Whew. Um, yeah. We'll we'll work with you, Chris. I mean, we'll work with you. Yeah. As long as one of the lawyers follows that. <laughs> so, I saw so I have a motion, a second that I'm not going to repeat, <laughs> and uh, to vote on agenda item seven. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Next item. Item number eight, consideration of a resolution to amend resolution number 2019-11-2R, which created the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee and established certain standards for the comprehensive plan process to establish a process for amendments to the draft plan if required as a result of public comment and hearing and providing an effective date. All right, this item was also as a result of the preliminary open meeting. Uh, late at, in the preliminary open meeting, we received some direction from council relating to procedure. And in order to ensure that the process was understood by everyone, it was staff's intention to and thought that the resolution that created the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee needed to be updated based on the direction as we understood it. So this is being proposed to try to ensure that we understand the direction uh, that was provided by council at the last meeting. So we're available for questions you might have. I have a question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this item has been the subject of several discussions today. Um, based on the discussions I've had, uh, I think uh, my understanding is that this was in response to a question I asked at the last meeting, 
but what I had understood and what I understand from others understood would like to happen from this point forward is that uh, the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee will have a meeting tomorrow night where they have an opportunity to pass the latest version of the plan that was passed by Planning and Zoning. After that, we would move, if, assuming the CPRC is in agreement, we would move to the public uh, comments period, the public input period. After that, instead of going back through the cycle of uh, CPRC and P&Z, it would then come to council and we would then be able to act on um, any amendments deemed necessary after the period of public input. First of all, I'd like to clarify that your conversations, because I know this, were not with other council members, just to clear up for the record that you were not violating the open Only one council member. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, I just wanted to make that clear for the record. And um, yes, thank you. I know you had a conversation with Mark and me, yes. and um, you had asked me if the legal requirements have been met or um, if the, I think the CPRC is meeting tomorrow night, if they, um, if they approve the plan by their qualification, supermajority vote. Without or, any further changes. Yes. That after it goes to the public comment period, that this come directly to council. And have we satisfied the legal requirements for that to happen? And the answer to that is yes. Thank you. Um, so to now disclose the conversation uh, that I had, let's say, with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Prince about this process, um, we could revise agenda item eight, but I think if if it's acceptable and we just provide direction. Yeah, I think the cleanest thing is just to, we were just trying to create a document that provided clarity. I think the cleanest thing is just for council to, um, to deny that and, um, and then to just provide verbal direction to, um, to staff to go to bring it back to council's next. Okay. So we still have to open this item up to the public hearing before we can do that, right? No, there's no. Oh, it's not a public hearing. There's no public hearing, hearing. hearing. Well, and a, um, you're going to establish resolution. the standards, but you're not going to do it by resolution. You're just going to do it okay. by direction. In, in that case, I would make a motion to deny agenda item eight and then to provide said verbal direction uh, that assuming the CPRC passes the plan tomorrow night without further amendment, that the it go to period of public input after which it will come to the required public hearing with council and second that rest motion. with council for action second that motion i have a motion and a second any comments all right thank you please vote vote to deny correct is yes i hope so because <laughs> i just voted it is Okay, well then we got it all wrong or we got it all right. <laughs> With that being said, if there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. identify a vehicle, lift the vehicle with a hydraulic